Star Wars, Coruscant Nights, Volume 3, Patterns of Force, by Michael Reeves, 2009, read by Christopher Hurt, restored and remastered by The Archivist Publishing. And now, the unabridged edition of the story. Your focus determines your reality. Master Qui-Gon Jinn. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Prologue. The voices rose and fell around him, but he paid them little attention now. He had tried to be attentive initially, but hearing the word smuggled, had spun Hananum Tikrinan off into his own private mental debriefing, on a mystery he sought to unravel for reasons of his own. The case the others were discussing, the murder of an insignificant being involved in smuggling a particularly nasty variety of spice, was of importance only to the local prefect of police, Paul House, which was another way of saying that, cosmically as well as locally, it was of no importance at all. Renan was almost tempted to stick his fingers in his hairy ears to block out the grating sound of the prefect's voice. There had been a time, back when he'd been the personal aide-de-camp to Darth Vader himself, when even letting such a thought cross his mind, even allowing the existence of admission of such poor etiquette, would have made all four of his stomachs turn acidic. Now he honestly had to admit that he didn't care. He wished he had self-sealing ear flaps like the lesser Hudogan of Clatooine, so that he could shut out the sound of the prefect as easily as closing his eyes allowed him to blot away the offensive sight of him. A poorer excuse for a Zabrak he could not imagine. In his considerable experience as an imperial functionary, he had never known a member of that species who was so impossibly slovenly. The police prefect's hair, what there was of it, was in wild disarray, as if he had run his fingers through it repeatedly. His clothing was disheveled, his posture was relaxed to the point of slouching. His heavy-lidded eyes made him look as if he were about to fall asleep. He recalled hearing a rumor once to the effect that the Elomen, his people, were the descendants of a group of Zabrak who had colonized the surface of Elom ages ago. Being in the prefect's presence, made him want to find whatever bescumbered ninny-hammer had started that calumny and hurl him into the nearest sun. Renan sat farther back in the form chair of his workstation, noting sourly that his mind, like a child lost in a carnival labyrinth, had wandered even farther from the meander it had originally taken. He suspected that he was edging ever closer to losing his sanity. Not surprising, considering the company he kept, he eyed the other beings in the austere living area with disdain. They were a motley group, to be sure. Besides the Zabrak prefect, who stood in the center of the room, there was the human, a Jedi in hiding, no less. Seated on one end of a low couch, he occasionally turned his head to look at the being seated at the other end, a Zeltron female, the very definition of trouble looking for somewhere to roost. The team was completed by a Celestin journalist named Den Dur, if one could call the sort of sensationalistic headline-grubbing poodoo he wrote journalism. Renan had read some of his pieces in various online archives, and in his opinion, comparing the little alien's writing to the Hutties' term for excreta was being charitable, to say the least. And lastly, the cause of the original detour Renan's mind had taken, the protocol droid I-5YQ which everyone referred to simply as I-5. Renan's eyes narrowed as he contemplated the droid. I-5 had once belonged to Jax Pavan's father, Lorne. Or rather, according to I-5, had been partner and friend to Lorne Pavan. The clever mech had smuggled itself, Dendur, and the rare biotic panacea called Bota to Coruscant in search of its partner's son, Jax. The Force-sensitive boy had, depending on who was telling the story, 
either been surrendered to or taken by the Jedi as a toddler. And although I-5's memory had been almost completely wiped, it had somehow recovered and completed its mission. Of course, it had taken two decades to do it. These things Renan knew mostly as the result of his own careful research. What he guessed. No, the very idea of guessing gave him hives. He preferred to think of it as imaginative extrapolation. Was that I-5 somehow completed a circle that included Jax, his deceased father, a mysterious Sith assassin, and the new Dark Lord, Darth Vader, whom Renan had recently served. What he knew through simple day-to-day -day experience was that I-5 was somehow, impossibly, more than a machine. Fascinating as that was, however, it still didn't address the pertinent question, which was, did the droid still have the Bota, or had it already handed that over to Pavan? The Elemen did not pretend anymore, even to himself, that his interest in the Bota was commercial. He might have hidden behind that rationale if the newest member of their mismatched team, the Zeltron Dija Duare, hadn't brought with her a dowry of almost unlimited funds. No, his interest was purely personal, but no less intense for that. The literature he had found on the hollow net had told him of the near miraculous medicinal effects Bota had on the sick and injured. Though these effects varied from species to species, including less than salutary outcomes for some. Still, according to the twenty-year-old records he'd dredged up from the mobile med units that functioned during the Clone Wars, Bota was as close to a panacea as could be imagined. With few exceptions, it was all things to all species. When administered, it would simply find what was wrong in a patient's body and, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, cause it to be fixed. Alas, this wonder was now no more than a wistful historical footnote. The Bota plant evolved swiftly, and as it evolved, its properties changed. What had once been a closely guarded, much sought-after medicinal herb was now merely an inconsequential weed. Except to a select few. Haninum Tik Renan was one of those few. The thing that made Bota of such intense interest to Renan had nothing to do with its healing properties, nor had he initially learned of that aspect of it from the hollow net. He had, and it galled him to admit it even to himself, gained early knowledge by eavesdropping on conversations between I-5 and Jax Pavan. In such a way he had learned of something Bota could provide that the hollow net did not catalog a transcendent connection to the Force, provided, of course, that the test subject had a sufficient level of midichlorians to make him Force-sensitive. Renan's own midichlorian count was not quite enough to access the Force unaided, but it was just possible that, with the Bota extract providing the requisite boost, he might. He'd long since come to accept, with the fatalism common to his kind, that he would die in poverty and misery. But he wanted to experience the Force just once before death. Just once. He wanted to be attuned to the power and pattern of the universe, and not deaf as a Dianoga. Just once he wanted to have the power and presence of mind and spirit to take out those responsible for his fall from grace. Just once. He wanted... I said... Isn't that pretty much what you discovered, Renan? The Elliman blinked and turned to look at Jax Pavan, who he realized must have repeated himself several times to have raised his voice to that level. The young Jedi was usually soft-spoken and soft-edged, a manner calculated to make him seem unthreatening. Even now, there was no anger in his voice, just bemusement. Jedi did not get angry, or so they liked to tell everyone. It was Renan's secret opinion that they got just as angry as the next being and simply hid it better. How could Pavan not be angry when the Dark Lord, allegedly responsible for his father's death, kept sending assassins after him? How did one possibly not rage against the universe when... Renan, Jax repeated, 
his dark gaze seeking the elements. His voice now held a touch of asperity. Pardon, I was contemplating a... an abstruse angle of another case. If you could be bothered to contemplate the rather more immediate angles of this one, said Paul House, I'm sure we would all appreciate it. Renan blinked again, slowly and for effect, and let out a long, patient breath. If you could repeat the question. Jax did. I was telling Paul House that the data you uncovered indicated that the conduit through which the Balrado was receiving spice had dried up just prior to his murder. Ah, yes, precisely. We reasoned, said Renan, bringing his mind efficiently back to the matter at hand that his reluctance to inform his buyer, a hut named Saul Proofrock, if you can believe it, interjected Den Dur from his seat in a window embrasure. As I was saying, continued Renan tightly, he was reluctant to inform his buyer, a hut with a variety of aliases, of this situation, which caused him to try to cover it up while he sought a new source of spice, which, unfortunately for him, failed to materialize added the Celestin. Renan favored the short, stocky humanoid with his most disdainful glare. Well, of course it didn't. Otherwise, the pathetic fellow would likely still be alive. What my research indicates, Renan told the prefect, wanting it to be perfectly clear that Dan had had nothing to do with the solving of the case is that one of the smugglers Rado contacted about his little problem, one Drew Wobbin, a fellow Toydarian, as it happens, revealed his situation to the buyer. That's speculation, though, Den interrupted, because you were unable to recover the contents of the message. All we know for certain is that Wobbin was in contact with good old Sol. I-5, standing just behind the low couch Jax and Deja were seated on, made a raspy mechanical chirp, that was the protocol droid's version of clearing its throat. Renan ignored the subtle warning. I suppose you think it's pure coincidence that Rado ended up dead within a day of that message having been sent, and coincidence as well that his loyal smuggler friend received a significant sum of credits to his private account in that same time frame? I didn't say that, Dan objected. I merely noted that we don't have titanium-clad proof that Wobbin's windfall had anything to do with Rado's demise. Though it does seem, you know, too much of a coincidence to be coincidental. Too much of a coincidence to be coincidental, repeated Renan disparagingly. He snapped his long fingers several times by way of applause. Brilliant assessment. He turned to address the prefect. The fact is, the fact is, growled Paul House, straightening to his full height, that I didn't come here to listen to internecine squabbling over who knew what how. I came here to find out what you knew about the flow of spice in my jurisdiction. You said you had pertinent information. We do said Jax Pavan quickly, including both squabblers in a quelling look. That's good, said House, because what I have is a dead Toydarian businessman, and I use the term loosely, and a sudden glut of pure spice in the Zeke Cree sector, a sector my research indicates is controlled by our multi alias to buddy the hut if you can't provide me with good intel renan opened his mouth to reply and was incensed to see the doors pendulous lips were also opening then i5 made that grating sound again which was really just too much to be censured by a droid we have provided you with only the most worthwhile intelligence prefect, I assure you, insisted Renan, far more forcefully than he meant to. You've also provided me with a surfeit of complaints from local merchants about harassment, more 
unknowns than should exist in any citizen's files, and the trail of dead bodies. Perhaps I should be investigating you, not Saul Proof Rock, or whatever our hut spice trader is calling himself these days. Before any of the open mouths in the room could utter a sound, Deja Duare rose from the couch and raised a graceful, placating hand. All eyes turned to her, all ears tingled in anticipation of her voice, all senses stretched toward her, involuntarily desiring to lap up every effusion of her softly gleaming carmine skin. With the exception of Renan and Dur, whose physiologies, though humanoid, were too alien to respond to Duare's endocrine advantage. A good thing, too, judging by the besotted looks that came over Pavan and House. Renan even imagined for a moment that the droid's photoreceptors brightened a bit, though he knew that was nonsense. Like all Zeltrons, Dijaduare exuded a rich potion of pheromones that she could guide willfully to affect the mood of her target audience. Right now, she had brought all her resources to bear on Paul House. Prefect, she said in a voice like sun-washed synth silk, Surely my citizen file is an open book. Can you imagine that I'd associate myself with beings whose scruples I distrusted in the least? If Renan didn't know better, he'd swear the Zabrak was blushing to the roots of his unkempt, thinning fringe of hair. With all due respect, the prefect said, this lot did ingratiate themselves with you during the investigation of your partner's death. Deja uttered a cascade of warm, sultry laughter that, if visible, would have been the same dark crimson as her hair. Ingratiated themselves. Now, Prefect, isn't that understating the case? Jax and his team, she added, turning a smiling gaze to the Jedi, solved Vesvolet's murder. And that is why I've chosen to ally myself with them. Each one of them is highly skilled at what he does. If Hananum Teek Renan provides you with information, you can be certain it is both accurate and worthwhile. The prefect looked bemused, and not a little befuddled. Well, I suppose. That is, of course, the information is worthwhile. I've never doubted it. And I honestly don't care about the holes in your personal files as long as you continue to provide that information. This last was directed at Jax, who nodded his assurance. We're happy to provide it, Prefect. In this case, I think the intel points to Rado's hut friend. I suspect what happened was that Wabin had his own spice source and simply cut Rado out, making a separate deal with his buyer. As Jax continued, wrapping up the package neatly, Renan returned to his speculations about I-5. Droids, he knew, were not supposed to have such capacities and capabilities as this one exemplified. Nor was it simply a matter of disabling a few limitations or reprogramming the synaptic grid processor with clever learning algorithms. Vess Volette, as it happened, had been slain by a modified 3PO unit that had retaliated against the Kamasi sculptor for causing distress to the Vendalian mistress he had served for decades. Plainly put, with some sophisticated modifications to its protective programming, the 3PO unit had developed an attachment to its owner. I-5 had developed far more than that, and he... It, Renan reminded himself with irritation, had somehow developed it in the hands of a man who made his living as a black market dealer in rare commodities. From everything Renan knew, the droid's erstwhile partner, Lorne Pavan, had been many things, but a sophisticated programmer was not one of them. Which begged the question, how had the protocol droid known as I-5YQ transcended its programming? And why? Hananum Tikrinan, much as he hated to admit it, agreed with Dendur about one thing. Some events were too much a coincidence to be coincidental. 
and just about every event to which he could now connect I-5 seemed to fall into that category. The droid would bear watching. Very close watching. Part 1. Sins of the Father 1. The library was his favorite place in the entirety of the immense Jedi Temple complex. He went there to absorb data as much through the pores of his skin as through any study of the copious amount of information stored there. He frequently went there to think, but just as often he went there to not think. He was there now, not thinking, and almost as soon as he recognized the place, Jax Pavan also realized that this was a dream. The temple, he knew, was no more than a chaotic pile of rubble, charred stone and ashy dust. Order 66 had mandated it, and the horrifying bloodbath that the few remaining Jedi referred to as Flame Knight had ensured it. Yet, here he was, in one of the many reading rooms within the vast library wing, just as it had been the last time he had seen it the softly lit shelves that contained books, scrolls, data cubes, and other vessels of knowledge from a thousand worlds. The tables, each in its own pool of illumination, at which Jedi and Padawans studied in silence. The tall, narrow windows that looked out into the central courtyard. The vaulted ceiling that seemed to fly away into eternity. Even as his dreaming gaze took in these things, he felt the pain of their loss. And something else. Puzzlement. This was clearly a force dream. It had that lucent, almost shimmering quality to it. The utter clarity of presence and sense. The equally clear knowledge that it was a dream. But it was about the past, not the future. For Jax Pavan knew he would never savor the atmosphere of the Jedi Library again. His force dreams had, without exception, been visions of future events. And they had never been this lucid. He was sitting at one of the tables with a book and a data cube before him. The book was a compilation of philosophical essays by masters of the Tython Jedi, who had first proposed that the force had a dual nature. Ashla, the creative element, and Bogun, the destructive light and dark aspects of the same essence. The data cube contained a treatise of Master Asli Crimson on the Potentium Perspective, a heresy propagated by a Jedi Lior Hal that contended, as many had before and since, that there was no dark side to the Force, that the darkness existed within the individual. Yes, he had studied these two volumes, among others, he supposed that all Padawans studied them at some point in their training, because all entertained questions about the nature of the Force and desired to understand it. Some, he knew, hoped to understand it completely and ultimately, to settle once and for all the millennia-long debate over whether it had one face or two, and where the potential for darkness lay, in the Force itself or in the wielder of the Force. When had he studied these last? What moment had he been returned to in his dream? Even as he wondered these things, a shadow fell across the objects on the table before him. Someone had come to stand beside him, blocking the light from the windows. He glanced up. It was his fellow Padawan and friend, Anakin Skywalker. At least he had called Anakin friend readily enough, but the truth was that Anakin held himself aloof from the other Padawans. Even in moments of camaraderie he seemed a man apart, as if he had a force shield around him, brooding. Jax had called him that once to his face and had drawn laughter that he, through his connection to the force, had known to be false. Now Anakin stood above him, his back to the windows, his face in shadow. Hey, you're blocking my light. The words popped out of Jax's mouth without his having intended to say them but he had said them that day, and he knew what was coming next. Anakin didn't answer. He simply held out his hand as if to drop something to the tabletop. Jax put out his own hand, palm up, to receive it. It 
was a pyronium nugget the size of the first joint of his thumb. Even in the half-light, it pulsed with an opalescence that seemed to arise from deep within, cycling from white through the entire visible spectrum to black, then back again. Somewhere, Jax just couldn't remember where, he had heard that pyronium was a source of immense power, of almost unlimited power. He had thought that apocryphal and absurd. Power was a vague word and meant many things to many people. What's this for? he asked now, as he had then, looking up into his friend's face. For safekeeping, while I'm on Tatooine, Anakin said. His mouth curved wryly. Or maybe it's a gift. Well, which is it? Jax asked. The answer, then, had been a shrug. Now it was a cryptic phrase, uttered in a deep, rumbling voice, not at all like the Padawan's own. With this, journey beyond the Force. Jax laughed. The Force is the beginning, middle, and end of all things. How does one go beyond the infinite? Instead of replying, the Anakin of his dream began to laugh. To Jax's horror, Anakin's flesh blackened, crisping and shriveling as if from intense heat, peeling away from the muscle and bone beneath. His grin twisted horribly, becoming a skull's rictus. Worst of all, laughter still tumbled from the seared lips. Jax woke suddenly and completely bathed in cold sweat. With this journey beyond the Force? That was impossible. It made no sense. And what was with the burning? He shivered, his skin creeping beneath its clammy film of sweat, as he recalled one of the rumors of where and how Anakin was supposed to have died on Mustafar thrown into the magma stream by no one knew who. Is something wrong, Jax? Jax glanced over from his sweat-soaked bed mat to where I-5 stood sentry, his photoreceptors gleaming with muted light. Jax hesitated for only a moment. It might seem a futile monologue to discuss a dream with a droid, but I-5YQ was no ordinary droid and even if he were, there was value in talking out the puzzling dream, even with the supposedly non-sentient being. If nothing else, Jax reasoned that sorting through the images, actions, and words aloud would help him understand them. He sat up, leaning against the wall of his small room in the Pelota Place Conapt he shared with the rest of his motley team. I dreamed. I've read that all living things do, I-5 observed blandly. Jax was seized with sudden curiosity. Did I-5 dream? Was that even possible? He wanted to ask, but quelled the urge, instead launching into a detailed retelling of his own nighttime visitation. When Jax at last exhausted the account, I-5 was silent for a moment, his photoreceptors flickering slightly in a way that suggested the blinking of human eyes. Finally, he said, May I point out that this would seem to contradict the knowledge you received through the Force some months ago, that Skywalker was still alive? Well, yeah. Jax ran fingers through his sweat-damp hair. Although he might have been injured on Mustafar, I suppose. Possibly, although other possibilities abound. It might have a more metaphysical meaning, for example. Or it might be an expression of your own inner fears. That's not usually how forced dreams work, but I suppose it's possible. I've never had one like this before, Jax admitted. I mean, a dream of the past rather than the future, for one thing. And an edited past at that. Anakin didn't say anything about the Force when he gave me the Pyronium. He just asked me to keep it for him while he went to Tatooine. And I think I'd have noticed if he burst into flames, he added wryly. I fives eyes flickered again, seeming to convey amusement. The door chime sounded. Jax checked his chrono, but I-5 was ahead of him. It's 0700 hours. It was in a terribly early hour, this deep and down-level Coruscant, 
where few acknowledged either day or night. But most sentients seem to agree that some hours were impolite for calling on one's neighbor. Jax rose and padded out of his room into the larger main living area, noticing that the rest of his companions were either asleep or out. I-5 followed him. As he moved to the front door of the Conapt, Jax sent out questing tendrils of the Force to the being on the opposite side of the barrier. In his mind's eye, he saw the energy there, but he perceived no telltale threads of the Force emanating from or connecting to them. Every Jedi experienced and perceived the Force in intensely personal ways. Jax's particular sensibilities caused him to perceive it as threads of light or darkness that enrobed or enwrapped an individual and connected him or her to the Force itself and to other beings and things. In this case, there seemed to be no threads, though there was a hint of a, well, a smudge. That was the only word Jax could think of that even vaguely fit. Curious for the second time that morning, he opened the door, smiling a little as I-5 stepped to one side to take up a defensive position where he would not immediately be seen by whoever was outside. In the narrow, starkly lit corridor stood a short, stocky, male Sakian, whom Jax guessed to be in his sixties, dressed in clean but threadbare clothing. He blinked at Jax's appearance. He was wearing a loose pair of sleep pants and hadn't bothered to put on a tunic. I... I apologize for the hour, the Sakian stammered, blinking round eyes that seemed extraordinarily pale in his bronze face. But the matter is urgent. I need to speak to Jax Pavan. Jax scrutinized the Sakian again, more thoroughly, and with every sense he possessed. Sensing no ill intent, he introduced himself. I'm Jax Pavan. The visitor's face brightened, and he heaved a huge sigh of relief. By any chance, do you happen to own a protocol droid of the I-5YQ line? I don't own him, Jax replied cautiously. But yes, he's here. What do you want with him? Er, uh, the Sakian executed a slight bow. I apologize for my extreme lack of manners. My name is Tudin Sal, I-5 said, stepping out of the shadows beside the door. The droid pointed an index finger at the Sakian. A red light gleamed at the tip, the muzzle of one of the twin lasers incorporated into his hands. His photoreceptors gleamed brightly. I've been waiting a long time for this. Two. Kajin Savaros stood in the narrow cleft beneath a support pier, somewhere in the lower levels of a cloud scraper on the long axis of Plautical Market, and peered out at the rabble in the bazaar below. He wasn't sure what level he was on, truth be told. He only knew it was dark, noisome, and anonymous. This last quality, if Plautical could be said to possess qualities, was what had made Kaj seek it out. That and the ease with which he could sustain himself here, or at least it had been easy, until his narrow escape from an Inquisitor the day before. He shivered at the memory of that, as he weighed the gnawing of his empty belly against the risk that somewhere in this crowd of unknowns might very well be someone watchful, someone suspicious, someone who might know what he looked like and be steeped enough in the Force to sense his presence. He had been hungry, just like now, and cadging food several levels up in the sprawling, many-layered marketplace. The Inquisitor had seen him coax a street vendor into giving him a skewer full of lovely smoked fleek belly strips, and had cornered him before he could even half devour it. Even in his fear, the thought of the meat made him salivate. He needed to eat, but... Kaj glanced up and down the overrun bazaar. Shadow and light danced in an ever-changing royal of smoke from cook pots and braziers. Multicolored lights strung along kiosks, twinkled and winked to tempt the eye and draw in the potential customers who thronged the thoroughfare. There was no sign of the Inquisitor or another like him. 
they made a point of remaining incognito. It would seem that the sheer, staggering amount of sentience, human and otherwise, that populated the city planet would afford more than enough protection for the individual who sought a lifetime of anonymity. Coruscant, Kaj shook his head in annoyance, reminding himself again to refer to the newly renamed Ecumenopolis as Imperial Center in both thought and speech. Imperial Center was home to literally trillions of beings from across the length and breadth of the galaxy, and finding a single one among them all was more difficult by far than finding a single grain of sand on Tatooine, Bacca, and all the other desert worlds combined. Hidden in the teeming multitude, he was safe. As long as he didn't use the Force. Which was no more difficult than, say, swallowing white-hot lava. When he went for some time without actively using the Force, but instead simply kept it pent up within, it burned. It was like having a big chunk of fire lodged behind his sternum. He found it hard to breathe, harder to sit still. It quite literally raised his internal temperature. After a few days, Kaj found himself sweating and running a low-grade fever. If he kept it bottled down much longer than that, say another week or so, well, he'd only done that once. When he'd woken up in the middle of the night, he'd felt, at first, blessed relief, followed by heart-stopping fear. The bed of the cheap reza block he'd rented for the night had been soaked with sweat. And in the far wall, a circle a meter wide had been charred into the paint. After that, Kaj tried to bleed off whenever he felt the force building up out of control. He concentrated on small telekinetics, levitating pieces of food or other objects, as those seemed to provide the most relief for the amount of effort expended. So far, it had worked. But he still quaked with the fear of being sensed by one of the malevolent inquisitors, every time he had to do it. Kaj's gaze wandered back to a kiosk some twenty meters distance, at which several shoppers were haggling with the vendor over the assortment of produce, most of it illegal. The kiosk had food bins on three sides and was open at the back. That was unfortunate, but the booth next door had a tatty fabric awning, one corner of which was tied down not far from the back of the produce vendor's kiosk. With his usual front-door methods rendered too risky, Kaj decided on a less direct approach. He pulled the cowl of his cloak up around his face and eased into the crowd. The stew of energies, aromas, and stenches flowed around him. The heat of someone's regard when he accidentally bumped into her caused him to cower. He tamped down the anger that seemed to crawl to the surface of his mind when he was confronted by large crowds of people intent on their own business. He supposed he was no different in that from any of the beings here. But he was different in other ways. He drew level with the awning and ducked sideways out of the flow of traffic, making his way around to the back of the booth. It was even darker back here than in the shadowed arcade and he took advantage of that to slip into the deeper blackness of the narrow passage that ran the width of the booth between its fabric back wall and the ferrocrete surface of a cloud scraper's dingy exterior. When he emerged from the narrow slit on the other side of the booth, which, from the wild dance of aromas, he realized was an herbalist's shop, he found himself less than three paces from a row of fruit bins containing little that was familiar and much that was not. Not wanting to risk discovery for something that might not even be edible to a human, he scanned the bins for something familiar. Finally, he saw what he was looking for, a basket of darrow root. Mouth watering, he edged beneath the tightly pulled corner of the awning and crouched, his eyes on the treasure. Darrow root grew on several worlds that humans had colonized. His had been one of them. As a child, he had developed a taste for the sweet, creamy, golden flesh of the root, and now, as hungry as he was, he was sure it would provide the most delicious meal in recent memory. A gaggle of shoppers was passing the kiosk, occasionally obscuring the darrow from sight. He willed them to find the produce here uninspiring and to go elsewhere. They did. Kaj leaned forward and raised a hand toward the prize. 
Sweat trickled into his eyes, startling and, and disrupting his concentration. He swore, swiped the salty rivulet away, and reached out again. His hand was shaking, he realized, and not with hunger. His encounter with the Inquisitor yesterday had been much more than merely disturbing. He was scared, plain and simple. Scared of doing anything to call attention to himself. Their attention, anyway. He flattered himself that he was well capable of handling the unwelcome attention of ordinary people. But Inquisitors were not ordinary people. They were the Emperor's watchdogs, and they had powers he could only guess at. He steeled himself. Two seconds. It would take only two seconds to procure a couple of pieces of the alluring food. He would open the way to the Force, and then close it, quickly. Simple. It would be simple. Resolved, he wiped the sweat from his palm, stretched out his hand, and called. A darrow atop the pile wiggled, then rolled down the mound of produce to drop to the ground unnoticed. He called again, and it flew unerringly to his hand. His heart, which had been beating out a wild tattoo in his chest, calmed. Not bad. And not an inquisitor in sight. Or sense. Encouraged, he decided to get more. He tucked the fat golden root into an inner pocket of his voluminous cloak, raised his hand, and... He felt it then. A sick trickle of dread coursing down his spine. The sudden eddy in the force, as someone nearby, groped for the one who had just used it. Kaj sensed purposeful movement in the crowded avenue before the produce vendor's stall, saw people moving swiftly out of the way of something or someone who was in a great deal of haste. He bit back his fear and threw a desperate, sharp salvo of thought at the bin of Darrowroot. Amplified by a charge of adrenaline, the blast hit the bin like a burst from a repulsor field. Darrowroots exploded into the air and cascaded to the ground, rolling every which way. Patrons milling about the booth reacted haphazardly, sidestepping, ducking, bobbing, and weaving to get out of the way, slipping on splattered fruit, and stumbling out into the overcrowded avenue. Kaj used the distraction to scoop up two more of the precious gourd-shaped roots, before he hurriedly withdrew, scurrying rodent-like along behind three or four stalls in the row, before finally emerging at the corner into a cross alley. He'd secreted the darrow roots on his person by that time, and glided into the flow of foot traffic, straightening his cloak. He smiled grimly, a strange mixture of relief and exhilaration flooding him with warmth. Once again, he had barely avoided detection. Once again, he had eluded the Emperor's minions. He had a swift vision of himself as a much sought-after prize, a shadowy, rogue, force-sensitive, dancing on the fringes of society always one step ahead of the Inquisitorious and its frustrated operatives. He could almost see himself leaping between the sky-raking buildings, flitting along ledges, an elusive silhouette, a powerful possessor of the Force, a Jedi. A sudden, almost overwhelming surge of anger arose in Kaj's breast to swamp his relief and drown his self-congratulatory daydreams. Once, in a more enlightened age, he would have become a Jedi and been instructed in the ways of the Force, honing his relatively newborn skills, skills that had fully awakened only this past year. But the Jedi Temple lay in ruins, and the Order had been scattered all across the galaxy, if there were any left alive. He alternately hoped for and despaired of that, and raged at the universe and the Force itself. He gritted his teeth, trying to suppress the seething anger that burned through his veins. No, there are no Jedi left, he told himself. I'm alone. Alone. Alone with this power that grew inside him, demanding to be used. He both gloried in it and was terrified of it, especially in moments like these when resentful rage burned in him, a rage that had no target at which to vent itself except, perhaps, the Inquisitors. 
He hated and feared those shadowy beings, but it was not safe to attract them, not safe to target them with his anger. So Kaja's rage remained directionless, aimed at no one and everyone. He held it tightly to him, because to give in to it, to allow it to escape his careful control, would be as good as sending up a giant flare that said to the Inquisitors, Come get me! Kaj stepped out of the street as a hover lorry approached, sucking himself tightly up against a stained and pitted support girder that had been erected to shore up the ruined facade of what had once been a gaming parlor. A tug of awareness made itself felt through the coils of control he struggled to maintain. He tilted his head up and glanced across the way. A man, a human, was staring at him from the dark, crooked doorway of the building opposite. Before he could think better of it, Kaj erased the man's memory of him, using the force to slide into the other's mind and rearrange his thoughts. He'd never attempted such a thing before, but it was easier by far than he'd expected it to be. He scooted sideways and insinuated himself into a mixed group of aliens as the hover lorry blocked his view of the staring man. With just a little more effort, he knew he could have made the other step out in front of the vehicle. It would have been easy. Too easy. He shuddered, put his head down, and immersed himself in the crowd. Dendur stumbled sleepily into the central room of the Conapt, rubbing sleep out of his eyes. When his vision cleared, the sight that met him stopped him dead in his tracks. In frozen tableau, he saw Jax, I-5, and a strange Sakian standing just inside the open front doorway. I-5 was pointing at the Sakian as if delivering a lecture, which was what one might think if one didn't know about the specialized lasers built into each of the droid's forefingers. Den knew about them, however. He shook himself more thoroughly awake, resisting the temptation to rub his eyes a second time. Had I-5 fried a circuit? And what the frip was Jack's thinking? This guy could be a potential customer. This was no way to treat a potential customer. Uh, Den said, guys, who's our new friend? The droid's photoreceptors blinked in a gesture so alive that Den batted his own eyes before he could resist the urge. Jax cleared his throat. I-5? The droid made a sound like a human sigh and lowered his arm. I've obviously been around organics too long. I picked up some bad habits, such as holding grudges. Okay, Jack said. May I ask why you're holding a grudge against our guest? Yeah, Dan agreed, bustling farther into the room. In fact, why don't we invite our guest to come in and sit down, get him a drink, and ask him to explain what he might need from us? What I need, first and foremost said the Sakian, as he moved to sit uneasily on the utilitarian couch that graced one gray wall. Is to apologize to I-5. Den stared at Tudin Sal. You what? Apparently, Jack said. Tudin Sal and I-5 have some kind of history. The Jedi had perched on the arm of the couch, from which vantage point he could watch both the Sakian and I-5. Wise of him, Den thought. He crossed the room to hand their guest the glass of water he'd just drawn from the tap. The Sakian stared at the glass as if he'd never seen anything like it before, and Den had a momentary panic attack, trying to remember if Sakians had some allergy to or other problem with water. But then Tudin Sal accepted the glass, issuing a wheezy laugh as he did so. History indeed or the lack of it in I-5's case. It seems rather odd to me, too, I must admit. I'm still not quite used to the idea that I-5 is, for want of a better term, self-aware. Self-aware, said I-5 dryly, is a perfectly good term, thank you. Tudin Sal nodded. Yes, I'd forgotten how perfectly good... He looked directly at the droid who stood facing him. Probably, Den thought, about 
two subroutines away from firing up his lasers again. The Sakian lowered his eyes and took a moment to straighten the folds of the calf-length coat he wore over his once elegant tunic. Then he looked up at I-5 again. I'm sorry, I-5, for what I did to you. I was short-sighted and selfish. You can add to that disloyal, disreputable, unscrupulous, and cruel, I-5 told him. You were, in a word, wrong. You can have no idea what your action ultimately cost the Jedi and the Republic. The Sakian closed his deep-set eyes momentarily, veiling his thoughts. No, I don't believe I can. Den pulled himself up into the window embrasure adjacent to the couch. He favored this spot because it gave him the advantage of height, a rare perspective for a native of Sullust, and allowed him to study other people's faces from a proper angle. This is all very cozy, he said, letting his short legs dangle over the windowsill. But would one of you mind clarifying why this apology is necessary? I-5 canted his head pointedly at Tudin Sal who cleared his throat and rearranged his coat yet again. Some years ago, he said, a, a friend asked me to make sure I-5 and some data he was carrying got to the Jedi Temple here on Coruscant. Den didn't need the Force to see the effect of those words on Jax. The young Jedi stiffened. My father. My father, Lorne Pavan. Asked you to get I-5 to the Jedi. Tudin Sal nodded. Yes. I didn't realize at the time that he... that it was something in the nature of a dying wish. Since then, I've come to appreciate that Lorne trusted me with the task because he expected not to live much longer. Unfortunately, he was correct in that expectation. Why didn't you carry out that wish? Jax asked, his voice hushed. Den glanced at I-5. Though he gave no outward indication of tension or increased interest, his friend knew that the droid had been waiting for a resolution to this mystery for over two decades. The Sakian spread his hands in the universal sign of bewilderment. Quite simply, I saw a profit to be made from the droid, and with the hubris that often comes with success, I figured I could kill two Minox with one blast. I had intended to deliver the holocron I-5 was carrying to the Jedi, as Lorne had asked, but I first planned on having the droid mind-wiped and reprogrammed as a bodyguard for use during my dealings with Black Sun. He had certain modifications I had never seen in any protocol droid, not in any droid come to it. Modifications I hadn't even realized were possible. Yet you failed to note the most significant of them, said I-5. I did, Sal admitted. Frankly, I couldn't believe what Lorne told me about you. I wish now that I had not been so... short-sighted. Traitorous, I-5 said simultaneously. Den had to admit that I-5's characterization was closer to what he'd been thinking. How could someone behave that treacherously toward a supposed friend? Den hoped he'd never become so mercenary or so jaded that he failed to put the welfare of his friends or his world before his own short-term benefits. Tudin Sal sighed. I can't deny it. But I did plan on getting the holocron to the temple. I did. The best of intentions, I found, said the droid, are by themselves seldom enough to topple tyrants. There came a silence, which was verging on uncomfortable, when Jax asked, Then what happened? I had my fingers in several pies at the time, not all of them legal. I sent I-5 to be reprogrammed, then returned to my business offices and discovered that a competitor had instigated a hostile takeover of my companies. Every last one of them. I went from riches to rags virtually overnight. Quite simply, 
I didn't get the holocron to the Jedi Council because I no longer had the means to do so. I was under siege. I had to go into hiding and liquidate most of my remaining holdings and property, including I-5, whom I traded to a spice smuggler with his memories wiped. He paused to regard the droid with obvious respect. Or so I had thought. I had spared no expense, ordered the most thorough quantum cleansing available. Apparently, I-5 possesses subroutines and resources that are proof even to that. It took me a very long time, the droid said, with harsh emphasis on the last three words. But I was at last able to recover my full memory. The Sakian shook his head. That should not have been possible. And yet, here you are. And here I am. Unlike you, I have never managed to claw my way back. Eventually I gave up trying. Especially once I discovered that the takeover of my businesses was not, shall we say, an idea original to my competitor. I confronted him some years down the line and learned that he had been bankrolled by then-Senator Palpatine himself. My friend was essentially acting as a proxy, though I dare say he was allowed to keep a good deal of what he took. Why? Jax asked. What did you have that the Emperor wanted? I suspect I was simply an easy target, Sal said, bitterness dripping from each word. My financial circumstances made me vulnerable, and Palpatine, while by no means in desperate straits, like all politicians, preferred to use someone else's money to finance his governmental takeover. He smiled a hard, painful smile. You know what they say. It's not personal. It's just business, Den finished. Yes, they'd all heard those words before. And I have, I must admit, used, if not those very words, certainly the spirit behind them, more than once. But I was never stupid enough to cross the government, he shrugged. Perhaps it was that very hesitancy on my part that made me seem easy prey. Whatever the reason, the new regime ruined me. Worse than that, they blacklisted me and made it impossible for me to recover. Even Black Sun wouldn't do business with me, which has implications I'm reluctant to think about. He hesitated, then added, It wasn't just the businesses, though the gods of misfortune know how devastating that was. No, I also lost my family, my mate, my children. Ah, said I-5. Ironic, isn't it, how fickle people can be, even those you expect to be loyal. It wasn't fickleness, Tudin Sal said with some asperity. It was fear. I didn't just lose my visibility. I lost the ability to dare visibility. There is still a bounty on my head, I'm sure of it, though I've never been able to confirm it. When someone attempted to kidnap my youngest child, I sent my family off-world. I had no choice. And you've been living down here, lying low? Jax shook his head. I hope you weren't hoping to hide out with us. I've got a price on my head, too. And, like you, I don't know why. I'm through lying low, announced the Sakian. I'm fighting back. I've joined the whiplash, which is how I came to find you, he nodded at Jax. You joined the whiplash, Jax repeated, for the purpose of finding I-5. Den well understood the skepticism in Jax's voice. The Whiplash, the underground organization of which Dan and his companions were a part, was dedicated to undermining the Empire's doings and rescuing its victims. It was an organization that thrived on secrecy to the extent that its operatives often didn't communicate openly for long periods of time, were informed of missions on a need-to-know basis, and did not admit new members without having first subjected them to stiff scrutiny. No, the Sakian answered, for the purpose of fighting the Empire. Finding you and I-5 was serendipitous. 
I had given up on finding you. In fact, I was convinced you were dead, and the droid had been broken up for parts by some yokel who had no idea what he was holding. I would never have found you if my first assignment with the whiplash hadn't introduced me to Laranth Tarak. Jax reacted visibly to the mention of the Twi'lek's name, but before he could do much more than gape like a Celestan fluke fish, I-5 interjected, which begs the question, why have you found us? The Sakian was suddenly quivering with unwholesome excitement. Or at least the glint in his pale eyes made it seem unwholesome to Den. I have a mission for I-5, one for which his special modifications, specifically his concealed weaponry and his lack of certain standard inhibitions, would suit him ideally. And that would be, asked I-5. You, my old friend, said the Sakian, smiling for the first time, would make the ideal assassin. You want I-5 to assassinate somebody? Jax shook his head. That's not the sort of mission the whiplash usually involves itself in. We protect people, extricate them from unhealthy situations, find them safe passage off-world. We don't indulge people's vendettas. This could be seen as something in the nature of a personal mission, Sal admitted, though I assure you it will serve all lovers of freedom, including the Jedi, in ways you can't imagine. With I-5's modifications and the anonymity that comes with being a droid, well, there couldn't be a more perfect liquidator. Now, just a moment here. Den raised his hands and slid down from the window embrasure, noting as he did that the wan light falling through it from outside, a weak trickle of half-dead sunlight from above and artificial illumination from below, made his shadow on the ferrocrete floor loom many times his real height. He was glad of that, because he needed to feel bigger just now. Tudin Sal's last words that turned his insides to quivering gel. I-5, an assassin? What kind of sick nonsense is that? He may be just an anonymous automaton to you, but to me he's... he's... Den hesitated, realizing that he had never articulated what I-5 was to him. He also realized that the droid's ocular units were trained right on him. He's my friend! Okay, and Jack's his friend, and we don't want to see him put in harm's way with the callous disregard you'd show a... a... a machine, finished I-5, with a tone of voice that in an organic would have been accompanied by a raised eyebrow. Yeah, he admitted it himself not a minute ago, Five. You're not a programmable toy. We can't just pump you full of code and send you into a dangerous situation as if you were some expendable piece of equipment. You have volition. You're a person. Den felt those words in that moment as perhaps he never had before, knowing to the soles of his boots that he would not, could not, send I-5 into a potentially no-win situation alone. A swift chill cascaded down from the crown of his head. And just what did that imply? That he would volunteer to go along? I-5's gleaming metal face was, as always, expressionless. Yes, the droid said. As you point out, I have volition, which means that I have both the capacity and the right to determine in consultation with the team, of course. He tilted his head toward Jax. What missions I will or will not undertake. But, he hesitated, something he rarely, if ever, did. Your concern is noted, Den, and the sentiment behind it, mutual. I-5 then shifted his attention to Tudin Sal so suddenly the den felt as if a physical support had been knocked from under him. Obviously, before we can entertain the idea of such a mission, I-5 told the Sakian, we need to understand it more fully and weigh its potential for good or ill. Who, precisely, do you want me to assassinate? Tudin Sal smiled, and there was an almost mischievous glint in his eye now. Allow me to test your knowledge of arcane historical esoterica. Have you ever heard of the Monarcho-Mex? I-5 did not hesitate. 
Yes. An obscure sect of fanatics out in the Eastern Expansion around 400 standard years ago. They opposed the absolute monarchy of their system of worlds and promulgated tyrannicide. Like the Bomar monks of Tatooine, they were not droids but cyborgs, essentially encapsulated organic brains in robotic bodies. The name in Middle Utanese is a play on the portmanteau, meaning killers of monarchs. I-5's voice was somewhat more subdued, almost speculative, as he continued. You want me to terminate Emperor Palpatine? 3. I beseech your courtesy, said Hananum Teek Renan, as he seated himself in a form chair adjacent to the couch on which the Sakian sat. I cannot possibly have heard you right. You want I-5 to assassinate Emperor Palpatine? Yes, that is essentially correct. Renan turned his head slightly to look at Jax, who stood behind the couch, his face devoid of expression. Lacking the Force, the Yellow Men had no way of knowing what the Jedi thought of this mad idea, though the very fact of his having allowed the Sakian to present it proved that he did not utterly reject it, as he should have, in the Yellow Men's opinion, had he even a milliliter of common sense. You realize, of course, that assassinating the Emperor is not exactly a new idea? Renan went on. The Sakian nodded. Yes and that it has been tried, with disastrous results, I might add, by people with far greater resources than we have. Tutan Sal raised a stubby digit. I beg to differ. None of the emperors would be assassins had any of the resources we possess. True, they had material means, perhaps even more than what you command. He nodded at Dijadwari, who had seated herself at the far end of the couch, a frown wrinkling her crimson brow. But they did not have a Jedi Knight in their number, or the intelligence resources of the Whiplash, or the invaluable services of someone so recently close to Lord Vader as yourself. And they most certainly did not possess a droid with I-5's special talents. Renan blinked at the Sakian. All that he had said was true. Which made it no less insane an idea. Certainly with Renan's knowledge of the internal workings of the Imperial Security Bureau, they might get close to the Emperor's foremost champion, and thence to the Emperor himself. And conceivably, with I-5's unique qualities, they might be able to make it all the way to the core of Imperial operations. But no, it was still insane. There was no other term for it. If the droid were to be captured, his memory banks could and would be scoured for information that would bring down the nascent resistance in its entirety. And as for what would happen to Renan himself, he trembled at the thought. The most meticulous and thorough of the Emperor's truth scan agents would happily don metaphoric duralumin toed shock boots and kick their way through the gardens of his mind and memories, merrily trampling all the delicate neuronal sprouts and branchings underfoot until naught but a bloody marsh remained. Renan closed his eyes wishing he weren't cursed with such a vivid imagination. He sighed gustily through his nose, rattling his tusks. No, he said, this is not to be contemplated. It's nerf-brained, preposterous, absurd. The risks are simply unacceptable. And once again, to the astonishment of all, I find myself agreeing with the tall, scraggly critter in the waistcoat. This came from the Celestin journalist, perched back up in his usual spot in the window embrasure. I've thought about this sixty different ways, and every one of them looks too risky by half. If anything happened to I-5... I-5? I five? Renan repeated in disbelief. All you're worried about is the droid? Have you no conception of what it would mean to the whiplash were I-5 to fall into enemy hands? Or to the remaining Jedi, said Jax quietly. If there are any, added Renan. The droid, said I-5 with subtle emphasis, would destroy his memory core if he felt his position was compromised. I'm more concerned that failure on my part would bring severe consequences for Jax or anyone else who might be caught facilitating my mission. For that reason, if I do this, I wish to do it alone, completely alone. 
five, Dan objected. That's ridiculous. You can't go it alone on a mission like this. You'll need intel, backup, an escape corridor. I can provide my own intel by slicing into the hollow net within the Imperial complex, thank you very much. I can provide my own backup as well. After all, who expects a protocol droid to be outfitted with hidden laser pistols and other defensive systems? I can also, I trust, create my own escape corridor. The droid turned to Jax. I would argue that one of the chief reasons for the failure of the other assassination attempts was that there were too many people and too many resources committed to the effort. The more individuals there are engaged on the ground in such an undertaking, the more points of discovery there are. Tudin Sal's gaze was riveted on the droid's gleaming metal face. What do you propose? Between myself and Renan, said I-5, I expect we can gain sufficient knowledge of Palpatine's itinerary that we can safely gauge his private locations based on his more public appearances. Once I know where he's going to be, it should be a simple matter of disguising my virtual identity, such that when I access Imperial nodes on the hollow net, I do so with an alias. A virtual disguise, Jax murmured. Precisely. Which is fine, except that you're a discontinued model, argued Den. You may be able to fool the net, but you're still a five-series droid. I'd bet good credits there aren't too many of those near the Emperor. No doubt he's got the newest, shiniest protocol droids Imperial creds can buy. Am I right, Renan? The Elliman nodded. Exactly right. No offense, I-5, but you are a bit of an antique. The droid actually managed to look offended. That's as it may be, but it's not an insurmountable obstacle. The model created to replace the I-5YQ series differs only in a few minor external details. For example, the ocular units are smaller and use a halogen light emission system with a characteristically blue-white radiance. The chest plate has been modified to include a repulsor unit. And lastly, the external bus couplings have been streamlined. These are things it should be fairly easy to cosmetically adapt in my own appearance. And, of course, I'll need a good polish. All easily arranged, said Tudin Sal. Even the polish. In that case throw in an oil bath and a circuit board tune-up. Done. While you're at it, you might consider picking up the tab for our memorial services, Deja Duare said, speaking for the first time since their impromptu meeting began. You sound as if you're planning a costume for a masquerade, Deja continued. Whether I-5 goes in alone or not, potentially he could focus Imperial attention on us and on the whiplash. I tend to agree with Deja, Jack said. There's a big surprise, muttered Dan under his breath. Jack's ignored the Celestin's grousing. This is something we need to think through very carefully. I don't think so, Deja continued, focusing her entire attention on the Jedi. I don't think so at all. It doesn't deserve to be thought through. She had clasped her hands over her breasts in what seemed almost a gesture of supplication. Please, Jax, don't let your personal feelings cloud your judgment. Let this go. Tell this man no. Tudin Sal turned to look up at the Jedi. What does she mean? Your personal feelings. Jax opened his mouth to answer, but I-5 beat him to the draw. There is every chance that Emperor Palpatine, though only a senator at the time, ordered his father's death. I should think you'd know that better than anyone here, he added wryly. After all, you were the last person to see him alive. He must have told you what he was planning to do after he turned me off. The Sakian's bronze skin darkened further, a dusky flush rising from his neck to his cheeks. He was going after the Zabrak. I figured then. That he was as good as dead? Asked I-5. If I've learned nothing else, I've learned that. Sal shook his head. My people's ancestors were warriors, but they can't match. No one in the galaxy can match humans for sheer bloodthirstiness. That said, Tudin Sal hesitated, seeming to age by a decade in the measure of breaths he took. If I had taken I-5 to the Jedi as promised, it is 
possible. His voice faltered to a stop. That the Jedi might not have been destroyed, Jax finished for him. That all of galactic history might have been changed for the better by one small action of yours. Yes. Sal's voice was very soft. There was a moment of silence in which DJ Duare looked from the Sakian to Jax to I-5 with an expression of incredulity on her pretty face. When she spoke, her words seemed to be for Jax alone. Well, there it is. Yet another good reason not to involve yourself in this absurd, hopeless plot. For all you know, you could be the last Jedi on the planet. Jax shook his head. I'm not. The last real Jedi, then. Yes, I know you think the world of the Twi'lek, but she's not temple-trained. That doesn't make her less a Jedi. Deja blinked at him, obviously taken aback. That's irrelevant. You're missing my point. Or dodging it intentionally. If this plot were to be discovered and I-5 captured, it would lead straight back to you. It might enable the Emperor to snuff out the light of the Jedi entirely. The light of the Jedi? Jax repeated. Is that what I'm supposed to be? Well, then should I hide out doing nothing until I die at a ripe old age? Having done nothing? New Force sensitives will be born, said I-5 philosophically. Someone has to train them if they are not to fall to the dark side. Jax looked up, startled. By the nine gods of fury, Renan thought. Has he really never contemplated that before? Or did it just stun him coming from a soulless hunk of metal? Which, I-5 continued, is all the more reason that, if I were to undertake this mission, you should be as far away from me as possible. Renan blinked at the tone of the droid's voice. Was that really wistfulness? The shadow of impending loss? He shook himself. I think it's all the more reason, he said to I-5, for you to forego this mission and do what you're best at, watching his back. He tilted his horned head toward Jax. Tudin Sal cleared his throat. As I-5 so aptly pointed out, he is an independent being. With an off switch, muttered the Elliman. An independent being, repeated Sal with the capacity to make his own decisions. I-5 turned to Jax. I do have that capacity, but in this case I'd like to hear the opinions of all concerned parties, especially yours, Jax. In making this decision, I'd give your vote the most weight. Vote? DJ let out a peal of false laughter. If we had a vote, I vote no. As do I, said Renan. Ditto said Den. All eyes turned to Jax. He met each gaze in turn, last of all the droids, then shook his head. I don't know, he said quietly. I just don't know. He glanced down at the Zeltron. I think I need to go someplace where I can think this through. And I, thought Renan, Need to go someplace where I'm not so likely to be killed. Probus Tesla knew the peace of the Force. He had surrendered himself fully to its dark currents, and in moments such as this he felt the power of those currents moving about him and within him, buoying him up, tugging at him, washing through him, cleansing him. The Force was contentment. It was purpose. It was all to be an instrument of justice, to believe absolutely in the righteousness of that justice, conferred great power, and without the concomitant responsibility. He was a young man, barely into his twenties, young enough that power without accountability was a heady combination, young enough that the speed of his rise through the Inquisitorius filled him with fierce, hot pride to be picked out of a literal army of applicants and made the personal factotum of the Dark Lord himself. It was a dream come true, to hone his power under the tutelage of Darth Vader, 
was to drink from water very pure, very close to the source indeed. Now he stood in Vader's presence and felt that purity of power flowing over him in thrilling waves. It was all he could do not to grin drunkenly with pleasure, but he kept his face composed and his spirit calm as he received his orders from his master. In fact, he noted with bemusement, his mentor seemed less serene than he was. The Dark Lord had been pacing when Tesla had entered the room, and had not ceased doing so in the time the young Inquisitor had stood silently, awaiting his lord's pleasure. At last Vader spoke, his voice washing over his acolyte like a deep cooling tide. I have sought Jack's Pavan for some time now. I have indeed made it a priority for reasons I have not shared with you. I commend you on your sense of duty, Inquisitor. Ever since I brought you in on this, you have not questioned my orders, though I sense you are curious about them. Now I have a new quest for you. Tesla blinked. A new quest? He had yet to complete the old one. My lord, I'm close to finding Jax Pavan he said in cool, even tones. I am sure of it. I've been working one sector at a time, and... A horrific thought occurred to him. Do you believe me incapable? Vader paused in his pacing and raised a gloved hand. Nonsense. I believe you quite capable. It is because of that that I'm giving you this new mandate. When you find Pavan, you are neither to challenge him nor to harm him. Your mission will not be complete until you have found the protocol droid that has been his sometime companion, the I-5YQ unit that reportedly was the property of Pavan's father. Pavan is a means to an end. Find Pavan and let him lead you to the droid. Of course, if you should be able to locate the droid in some other way, Pavan can wait. Had he heard right? Tesla shook himself mentally. It took every bit of discipline he possessed to remain stone-faced. He was somewhat taken aback when Vader sensed his dismay. Is there a problem, Inquisitor? No, my lord. No, no problem. Save that he had just been assigned to the scut work of locating a droid. A droid? You sent a stormtrooper on a fetch-and-carry mission like that? A lackey, someone with no special skills. Droids had no affinity with the Force, so sending a Force-sensitive on an errand like this was... Well, at best, it was a waste of resources. At worst, it was a slap in the face. I am aware, Lord Vader said, the insectoid lenses of his mask trained on the Inquisitor, that this presents more of a challenge. A droid is not Force-sensitive, and thus will not reveal itself in that way to someone who is but I have had it suggested to me that this is no ordinary droid. As if that made it any less an insult. More of a challenge, indeed. Did Vader imagine he was speaking to a drooling Padawan? But Probus Tesla was a professional. Despite his young age, he was a veteran of many such missions. He would perform whatever duty his lord deemed necessary, no matter how demeaning it was. He raised his head to watch Darth Vader stride to the well-camouflaged window of his sanctum, where he looked out at the cityscape below and beyond. There was no reading the face, hidden forever behind the obsidian mask, no body language to observe beneath the folds of the soot-dark robes, nothing but that earlier pacing, which indicated a certain disquietude. It occurred to Tesla that this was a test, not of his force abilities, perhaps, but of his loyalty and his perseverance. He squared his shoulders and aligned his spine. One thing he was sure of, something about this particular quest agitated the Dark Lord. Perhaps if Tesla completed his mission, he would find out what it was. With that in mind, he bowed deeply from the waist, knowing that his Lord could see his reflection in the window. Regardless of what kind of droid it is, my Lord, I will find it for you. And when I find it? Bring it to me, his master said shortly. In one piece and operative. 
and if possible bring Pavan as well, in the same condition. As you wish, my lord, Tesla said, and bowed yet again. He did not let his emotions show, not his disappointment, not his curiosity, not his hope that this was merely a gateway to greater things. The Force would be with him, as it always was. Perhaps it would help him find this droid somehow. And just maybe, he'd get lucky and catch a Jedi as well. Four. Probus Tesla. There it was again. That name. That face. Hananum Tikrinan increased the magnification of his hollow display and peered at the freeze-frame image of the Inquisitor he'd heard other members of the Whiplash refer to as the Blood Fiend. This was a human designation, originally a variant breed of Tarentatech used for tracking down sentients with an affinity for the Force, in particular, humans. The idea that humans hunted their own kind did not surprise Renan overly much, but knowing the provenance of the sobriquet in relation to Probus Tesla chilled him to the bone. Tesla was called the Blood Fiend because of his ability to sniff out his prey, force-sensitive humans. He was steeped in the dark side, and it was said his sense of the force was so delicately and exquisitely balanced that he could pinpoint its usage by a single being in a crowd of a million. Renan didn't believe it, of course, but he was self-aware enough to know that this was largely envy on his part. He was certain that, were he human, he could stand right in front of the Inquisitor and raise not so much as a ripple in the Force. No more, say, than a droid or a doorpost. The knowledge galled him. He reapplied himself to his surveillance. Here was Probus Tesla entering the Imperial Security Bureau yet again. According to the scanner records Renan had accessed, each time Tesla passed through the various checkpoints in this hive of Imperial activity, he visited not the offices of the Inquisitorius, nor the administrative centers of the Emperor's functionaries, but rather the palace quarters belonging to Darth Vader. This was interesting to Renan because he had also recently discovered, via a combination of hollow-net research and scuttlebutt from the streets, that Tesla had been asking questions about one Jax Pavan, not to mention a droid who might be keeping company with him, as well as an erstwhile Celestin journalist, and, last but unfortunately not least, an Elomin who might or might not be seen with one or more of these individuals. Interesting was not the operative term, of course. The information he was uncovering was, in a word, terrifying, because it indicated that Vader knew more about the company Pavan kept than was healthy for any of that company, most of all Renan, not to mention indicating that Vader had narrowed his search for the Jedi to this very sector of Imperial City. Renan made a minute gesture that flipped the display to a frame in which he had been compiling a map. This was a set of locations at which Tesla had been seen or had asked a series of seemingly random questions about a group of miscreants whom one would hardly expect to find in close proximity. The bright dots on the map formed a nearly circular pattern around the very neighborhood in which Renan sat at his holonet console. No doubt about it. Since Vader had brought in the Inquisitorius, the net was tightening. He wondered why the Dark Lord had waited this long to introduce the heavy guns in his search for Pavan, and shrugged. Who alive could fathom the mental machinations of Palpatine's second-in-command? No doubt Vader had his reasons for prolonging the search this long. Perhaps he had been waiting for other arrangements and affairs to be concluded. Or perhaps he merely enjoyed the whisper kit and mouse aspects of the hunt. It didn't matter. What did matter was that his former employer was obviously tired of fencing and was going in for the kill. Through Tesla, Vader had learned the names and occupations of all of Pavan's team of misfits, save one. As far as Renan had been able to ascertain, the only one whose name had not figured in Tesla's careful questioning was Dija Duare. Which was a good thing, because if she was linked to the Jedi in some way by the Inquisitorius, her seemingly bottomless well of funds might be unexpectedly siphoned dry. 
the element's pulse quickened, and a choking tightness seized his throat, uncomfortably close in sensation to one time when he had felt Vader's phantom grip close suggestively there. The connection between Deja and the rest of them, he realized, could be made at any moment. If he was going to get out of this situation, he should act now, while the Zeltron's wealth was still available to him. Quaking, he selected one of his newer aliases randomly from a cache of carefully compiled profiles of deceased and non-existent persons, then accessed a travel broker's holonet node and prepared to buy himself a ticket off-world. Just shy of completing the transaction, however, he hesitated. If he left now, he might save his sorry hide, but he would forever forego his chance of experiencing the Force. Unless he found the Bota and took it with him. Rinon sat back in his chair and stared, unseeing, through the travel brokerage's colorful hollow net storefront to the dingy gray wall of the Conapt, and contemplated the full implications of that. He had no moral problem with lifting the substance and fleeing with it. His only problem was that he wasn't certain who had it. He suspected I-5 still carried it, but he couldn't be certain that the droid hadn't already revealed its existence to Jack's Pavant. Even if he had, Renan realized, I-5 might still be the safest entity to guard it. There was no way that even a dark side sensitive such as Probus Tesla could disinter stray thoughts to any meaningful degree from a droid brain. The simplest thing to do, then, would be to kidnap I-5. He gave a half-laugh, half-snort that rattled his nose tusks. When kidnapping a freakishly sentient machine became the easiest of your options, you were in more trouble than you knew, especially when the droid in question was contemplating regicide. Still, I-5YQ was, when all was said and done, a mechanical device and like most mechanical devices, he had an off switch. That switch was hardwired to the droid's consciousness template and couldn't be removed without irreparable damage, in other words, killing him. Therefore, for all of Lorne Pavan's clever manipulation of the droid's programming and firmware, that master switch must have remained untouched. If Renan could contrive to get the droid alone long enough to somehow deactivate him, he could go through his pockets, so to speak, thoroughly, and without fear of reprisal. That, of course, was the trick. I-5's reflexes were preternaturally quick compared with even the dazzling reaction time of an Alina. Next to Renan, who was a diplomat, not a warrior, he was bottled lightning. And unlike the average droid, he wasn't programmed against shooting first and interrogating the result at his leisure. Renan backed out of the travel node and returned to his map. He considered the proximity of the Tesla hit closest to their bolt hole. How long, he wondered. How long did he have before he completely ran out of time? There was no way to know. He considered the sequence of his informant's reports about the Inquisitor and the amount of time that had passed between each of them. Based on this, he gave himself 24 standard hours to come up with a plan or to have circumstances present him with an opportunity to isolate, deactivate, and rob I-5. If he hadn't gotten the boater within the next day, he would simply leave. He was, after all, a practical being. He returned to the travel node and purchased a one-way ticket for the next outbound freighter on the Perlemian trade route to Liana, which was the closest planet to the outer rim in the sector nearest Elam. This time tomorrow... Renan promised himself as he transferred funds from the account Deja had set up for them. He would be on that freighter, with or without the Bota. Jax made his way along the narrow, serpentine length of Snowblind Muse. It was a running joke among the members of the team that the namers of the narrow passage couldn't have had even the vaguest idea of what the appellation meant. No one on Coruscant had seen snow for uncounted centuries. It was Den's opinion that the name shining from street signs at the occasional corner was actually a ribald phrase in Shistavanan or some other planetary dialect that sounded just like snowblind muse, and that whenever basic speakers uttered the phrase in the hearing of the aliens, they would howl with laughter. Jax walked slowly, 
tentacles of force sense curling outward toward the walls of the densely packed reza blocks that rose to dizzying heights on either side. It was not the worst neighborhood in which to live. In fact, the ornate stacks of conaps that lined the mews and looked out on the cul-de-sac plaza known as Pelota Place still wore a shadow of their original elegance. Their once gleaming walls were age-dulled and grimed, but there was a certain shabby respectability about the place that Jacks felt was to their advantage. Most people who hid out from the Imperial Eye went to the lowest levels of the city and dived into its deepest, darkest haunts. So when Imperial forces went shopping for criminals, that was the first place they looked. They did not often think of poking their noses into the more affluent areas around Poloda Place, usually a haven for artists and other creative types. Until now, Jax reminded himself, Renan had told him of the shadowy personage who had been nosing about recently, only one or two levels below. A human named Tesla, a man well-versed in the Force. An Inquisitor. Jax felt himself tighten up reflexively at the thought, and wondered at the vagaries of fate. If Tudin Sal had fulfilled his promise to Jax's father, he and Tesla might have been peers, possibly even friends. Now he was set at odds with a man he didn't even know. He reached across the street and began to walk aimlessly, trying to process Sal's proposal and the reactions to it of his teammates. Dan, Renan, and Deja were obviously dead set against the idea. That was understandable. They were afraid. It was just as understandable that I-5, who felt no fear, was willing to entertain the idea. Deja's alarm, however, had been palpable. He could still feel it tugging at him, imploring him. He wondered if it stemmed from the fact that the Zeltron's late partner, the light sculptor Vess Vallette, had been killed by a domestic droid. The droid, which belonged to the household of one of Vallette's most loyal patrons, had somehow come to reason that it must use deadly force to protect the interests of its mistress. It made emotional sense, in the abstract, that Deja should have a fear of droids but somehow the theory felt wrong under her particular circumstances. The crimson-skinned Zeltrons were a markedly hedonistic species of humanoid whose unique combination of exceptional beauty, empathic ability, and pheromone production made them often seem shallow. Deja was not shallow. She had grieved the loss of her partner and had stayed on Coruscant out of loyalty to the man who had solved his murder. It was surely that same loyalty, Jax reasoned, that caused her to argue so vehemently against Sal's plan, and not an irrational fear of putting a droid in a position where it could kill. In the brief time she had been living with Jax's team in their roomy conapt, she had shown no uneasiness around I-5. He was flattered, Jax realized. Flattered that Deja had become so attached to him that she had not returned to her homeworld as she had planned. He chided himself for the emotion. He'd gotten past the need to draw on the force to counteract Deja's heady combination of pheromones and telepathic subtlety. But occasionally, he caught himself having silly, almost adolescent thoughts about her. The fact that she had begged him not to leave the Conapt just now, expressing fear for his life with the Inquisitors at large, had likely contributed to those thoughts. He replayed their recent parting at the door of their apartment her gazing up at him, worry on her lovely face, her deep red lips parted, her eyes glittering with fear, her hands fluttering between them like startled birds. He had felt her willing him to embrace her and had deflected the impulse, though perhaps not as successfully as he'd thought. It would have been the most natural thing in the world to lean his head down and kiss her. It was a moment out of a romantic hollow vid. He chuckled and shook his head, Gotta watch that. He knew his Jedi discipline and the detached state it supported frustrated the empathic Zeltron, and he suspected she'd be pleased to know how attractive he found her. He was not numb to her pull. He felt it as a tingle on the skin, a flutter of his heart, a quickening of his pulse. But he was a Jedi, after all, and it took just a touch of the Force to deflect her attempts to influence him. He looked up to find himself at a crossroads. Left, right, up, down. 
which way to go. He struck out at random, stepping into the down tube. As he slowly descended, he found himself thinking unaccountably of Loranth Tarek. The Twi'lek Jedi had been absent from his team for several months now, and while this wasn't the first time he'd thought of her, it was the first time she'd come to his thoughts with such strength. He hadn't seen her since the day she'd quit the team to work full-time with the Whiplash and its leader, Taizan Yimon, a charismatic Syrian who, to hear his associates tell it, possessed the fighting prowess of a trained soldier and the wisdom of a Jedi Master. Strange, Jax thought. It hadn't occurred to him before to wonder why Laurent had abandoned their group. He recalled she'd been impatient with him about something. He'd never discovered what exactly. And there had been a moment when he'd visited her in the med center after her encounter with the bounty hunter Aura Singh, when he'd wondered if their relationship was sliding toward... He drew himself up short, recalling the day. Laurent, lying on the med couch, patched and tubed and pale, and him at her bedside, a royal of emotions turning him inside out. Had there been a moment when she had read him and feared he had grown too attached to her? Or had she already felt the pull of Yemun's personality? Or both? Or neither? He looked around and realized that his steps had taken him down into whiplash territory. In fact, he was only a block or so from the charity in whose headquarters the group occasionally held clandestine meetings. It was one place of contact between the insurgent organization and those who needed its help. It struck him in that moment that what he wanted most right now was Laurent's take on this whole business and her opinion of the trustworthiness of Tutan Sal himself. After all, they had only Sal's word that he was really a new whiplash member and that Laurent had sent him to their door. And even if she had sent him, that was no guarantee that his plan was sound. Jacks directed his steps toward the community kitchen that served as one of the whiplash's windows on the world. He was about three long strides from the door of the charity when an unseen compulsion abruptly settled violently about him like a bola, all but spinning him about. For several seconds, he felt like a feather buffeted in a strong wind. He put a hand out and steadied himself against the facade of the nearest building, reaching out with his senses to locate the source of the disturbance. Down. Down and to the west. That was where it was. What it was, was easy. It was the force. Five. Proba's Tesla returned to Plautical Market, despite the fact that his target had been changed. After all, he reasoned, the droid and the Jedi he sought surely were in close proximity to each other. The droid belonged to Pavan, or so reports suggested which led the young Inquisitor to wonder why his lord had changed the target in the first place. Find one, logic suggested, and you would eventually find the other. The Force had been telling him for weeks that a powerful sensitive was present in the environs of the marketplace. The chances of that being anything other than a temple-trained Jedi were vanishingly slim. Tesla's own Force sensitivity was the surest means of finding Jax Pavan, so why would Darth Vader set him on this detour instead? Was it a test, or was his lord simply guiding him to use his sense of the Force in a different way than he was inclined to do? The idea set him back on his heels, mentally speaking. Perhaps it was not his ability that Darth Vader doubted, but his loyalty. Perhaps what was being tested was not his skill, but his obedience. The thought raised a tendril of shame. He had doubted Vader's wisdom, if only for the briefest moment, and even as he went about seeking the protocol droid, asking questions of his contacts and sifting through the answers, he was hoping to encounter the presence he'd come so close to touching mere days before. He stood now in the shadow of a support pier, listening to the marketplace chatter, sniffing its panoply of scents, greed, acquisitiveness, anger, satisfaction, tasting the subtleties of those emotions, hoping to encounter the vibrancy of the Force. He experienced the Force that way, as scent, sight, sound, and savor. 
Every nuance of it thrilled his senses, playing darkly in his head, exploding on his tongue, dazzling his eyes with color and light. Because of the sheer power of those things, he'd had to learn at an early age to filter and control the impulses the force evoked in him. It had been a lifelong struggle to work through the potency of those impulses, and he often wondered if all force sensitives experienced it in this way. It was not the sort of question one was encouraged to ask other aspirants during inquisitorial training. He had spoken of it to his master, of course, for he had to learn the discipline of his gift. Master Kuthara had not commented on whether his particular experience of the force was unusual or common. He had only said, The force flows through you, around you. You must learn to sail its currents and harness its winds without letting them swamp you or blow you off course. Your discipline is a vessel, and you are the being whose hand is on the tiller. He had been about fourteen when that conversation had taken place and had suspected that his master experienced the force in just such a way, as a current to be ridden. He had been naive enough at the time to ask, But wind and wave have no motive, do they, master? We speak of an ill wind, but isn't that just a pretty conceit? The wind and waves are random. Your point? his feline master had asked, oddly puzzled. Tesla had grown used to Master Kuthara answering his questions before he could even frame them. The uncertainty thus expressed had been a bit unnerving. Can the force be said to have dark and light sides? Winds are neither dark nor light. Currents are neither dark nor light. They simply are. There had been a moment of suspended time in which he waited for his master to applaud his intuition, punish his audacity, or simply astound him with an answer of the utmost simplicity and profundity. He had more than half expected the latter so the answer he got had stunned him. You disappoint me, Probus, his master had said. It is the most elemental of understandings, that the force is a duality. You have mouthed that duality yourself, apparently without understanding it. Light and darkness simply are. It is that elementary. Impulsively, Tesla had blurted, But isn't darkness merely the absence of light? Light is made up of photonic particles, Darkness isn't made up of antiphotons, is it? For that question, he had been instructed to take his lightsaber and spend six hours practicing Shi Cho, the most basic of combat forms. Later, when he had lain on his bed, aching with fatigue and numb with boredom, his master had come to him in an odd frame of mind, if not apologetic, at least conciliatory. You will understand in time, Probus he'd said, that the force is neither as simple nor as complicated as we want to make it. It falls into the realm of neither science nor mysticism. Its use is at once an art and a discipline. Like sailing, Tesla had suggested. His master had nodded, a wry smile curving his thin lips. Like sailing or like learning to sort through and comprehend the world of the senses. Tesla sorted through his senses now, peering, scenting, tasting, listening, and still hoping that he would catch them. He raised his head and turned to look out over the marketplace, eyes narrowed. Through a veil of multicolored light, he saw a flash of blue-white radiance moving away rapidly. The scent came next pale and sweet and tangy at once. A sound that was almost musical danced and shimmered at the fringes of his hearing. He smiled in anticipation and dived after the sensory ghost. The crowd of shoppers parted before him as people recognized the uniform of the Inquisitor, cloak and cowl of an indescribable hue that seemed to shimmer with phantom color, the imperial crest upon one shoulder. Across the width of the teeming square, he trailed the bright target, determined not to lose it as it dimmed. He suspected the Jedi must have used the Force for something to have sent up such a vivid little flare just now. That puzzled him. It had puzzled him since the first time he'd picked up the telltale signature of a Force user. A trained Jedi would surely know better than to give in to displays of power in so public a place. And it was hard to believe he would have need to. This gave Tesla some pause. It was 
just possible, if not likely, that Jack's pavan was intentionally luring him somewhere. He bit back a chuckle of dark mirth. That would be futile. Propus Tesla knew, without ego, or nearly so, that his abilities were exceptional. He had been trained by one of the greatest masters in the College of the Inquisition, and he had earned his place in the Inquisitorius by utterly defeating that master. Regrettable, that. And it had drawn from Tesla the pledge that one day he would take Master Kuthera's place in the college himself, training aspiring inquisitors. He would never, he promised himself, give any of them any knowledge of himself that could be used for his undoing. Oh, yes. He'd come to understand well why it was best not to speak to others about one's own relationship with the Force. To understand others' sense of the Force was to understand how they could be defeated. He was dismayed to realize that the sensory target was dimming still further. Its scent was all but gone, its taste turned to dust, its music muted. Only the light of it pulsed at the fringes of his awareness from white to blue, paling against the mundane palette of the market. He hastened his pace, zigging and zagging through the crowd, until he reached a long, dark alleyway with a dim rectangle of light at its nether end. Gouged into the ferrocrete walls of the surrounding buildings, the alley seemed to lead nowhere. And yet this was where his quarry had gone. He pushed into the tunnel, senses groping before him as he moved. Once again he suspected a trap, and once again he discarded the idea. He was, after all, effectively shielded from detection by his Tauzin scale necklace. The Tauzin were huge segmented creatures that inhabited deep underground caverns beneath the planet city, and whose scales rendered their life force transparent to a force sensitive. Tesla's synth silk necklace didn't possess enough of the rare and dangerously gotten substance to block him entirely from another force sensitive, but it was enough to scramble whatever emanations of the force he leaked, and render them almost unreadable. Jack's Pavan, or any other trained Jedi, would have to work awfully hard even to get a fix on him. He fingered the strand of synth silk as he dived farther into the darkness of the passage, hastening toward its end. The rectangle of dim light grew ever larger. It was hypnotic, so much so that when he reached the aperture, Tesla very nearly stepped across the threshold to his death. The floor beneath his feet ended abruptly, and he had a momentary impression of a gaping chasm hemmed by unending walls and a drop into sheer nothingness. His reflexes were such that he was able to catch himself, but it was the wind that saved him, not the force. A veritable maelstrom spiraled up from the abyss, ripping his cowl from his head and lifting him bodily, tossing him backward into the tunnel like a piece of chaff. He lay against the wall of the tunnel for a moment, heart hammering, breath coming in short staccato bursts that echoed harshly against the stone of the walls. Then he picked himself up and approached the end of the tunnel with care. He poked his head through the door to nowhere and looked out. Above was a pale blur of eternal twilight. Below, he could see the vertical flank of the cloud cutter through which the tunnel bore disappear into darkness. Hundreds of yards away, across the chasm, stood another cloud cutter, its broad flanks sweating dank grime. There was no one in sight, and no place anyone could have gone. Anyone except a Jedi. He looked up, reaching out with his force sense. He stretched across to the far building. He angled a look down. And there it was, far below and to his right, that tiny point of light, the barest whiff of the perfume of power, the merest tinkle of sound. Hair rose up on his half-shaven head and down the backs of his arms. He smiled. Good try, Jedi, he thought, and stepped from the aperture into thin air. The force lowered him like an invisible turbo lift. The violent updrafts of the abyss buffeted him occasionally, tearing at his robes, but still he rode, silently, swiftly, his senses on that spot where one building ended and another began. The target had paused there below, but suddenly began to move again away from the chasm. At the crumbling intersection of the two buildings, at a point where their buttresses seemed almost to intertwine, 
there was a gap. Just enough of a gap for a humanoid of Tesla's size to pass through. Tesla jackknifed and threw himself through the air toward the gap, unclipping his lightsaber as he flew, but not igniting it just yet. He erupted through the needle's eye and into a cavern filled with rubble. His target had moved on ahead. He took only a moment to orient himself. The sheathing of the wall of the mammoth building on his right, the one from which he had dropped like a stooping raptor, had come away from the substrate and fallen in huge stone and duracrete panels against its nearest neighbor. What had once been a maintenance alley between the two had been transformed into a cavernous tunnel. But where the previous route had been narrow and human-sized with regular surfaces, this was a cave built by decay. Immense and asymmetrical, its ceiling ending in darkness far above his head, its uneven walls canted and uncertain, its floor littered with random chunks of rock and twists of dura steel, eroded and fallen from the buttresses. The wind sobbed inconsolably here, and the building seemed to groan and tremble at its passing. Above this there was another sound. No, not a sound exactly. More of a sensation. Almost a tingling in the air. Tesla hovered, perfectly still listening, sensing, feeling. It was not the force he felt, but some type of kinetic energy. He could feel it dancing across his cheeks and the backs of his hands, raising the narrow strip of red hair that ran from the crown of his head to the nape of his neck. A force field of some sort. He moved slowly downward, senses probing the way before him, eyes watchful. His boots touched down lightly on the rubble-strewn floor, and he strode forward. The cleft was about twenty meters long and ended in a dim wash of light that seemed to flicker and weave like the shadow of a fire. At random points along its length, dark apertures suggested other means of egress and regress. He eyed them suspiciously, but none of them held anything of note. Armored rats, hawk bats, perhaps, nothing sentient. The only sentient target he sensed was a head somewhere in or beyond that wash of inconstant light. Tesla activated his lightsaber. The blade hummed to life, the color of a sunset he had once seen on his home world of Corellia. It was also the color of the lava flows on Mustafar. He moved forward with cautious anticipation. The target had stopped. The threads Jacks followed were slender and impossibly bright, but they seemed to flicker and pulse as he trailed them down into the depths of Plautical Market. When he reached the lowest levels of the structure that housed the rambling bazaar, they were little more than the ghosts of threads, like an afterimage burned into the retina. They were on the point of vanishing completely by the time he dived into the warren of crevices in the towering resiblocks that roughly defined Plautical's borders. As he stood at the gaping mouth of one such crevice, several levels below where the marketplace petered out, he saw the threads break altogether. He stood for a moment, trying to decide what to do next, then froze at the sudden sense of presence behind him. He swept his lightsaber into his hand, activated it, and spun 180 degrees in one smooth movement. I see I'm not the only one who's had her aura tweaked today. Loranth Tarak faced him from an alcove in the dirty wall of the junction in which he stood. She had a blaster in each hand and holstered one of them as she stepped out of the alcove. Over her shoulder, Jax could see a set of steel rungs embedded in the alcove wall. Okay, not an alcove, then. A chimney or access tube. He used the trivial observation to hide his reaction to seeing Loranth so suddenly and under such circumstances and couldn't decide if he was excited or dismayed. You felt something, too? he asked stupidly. I think I just mentioned that. The green-skinned Twi'lex truncated left Leku, shifted slightly on her shoulder, and Jax had the irrational feeling that she was laughing at him, despite the fact that her mouth formed a familiar, grim line. As it ever did. Also irrationally. He was finding it difficult to look away from her face. 
He did so with a will, clipping his lightsaber back on his belt and nodding toward the crevice he'd been about to explore. I lost it right here. What do you think it is? She shook her head, moving to peer into the darkness. No idea. Inquisitor. I suspect most of them carry Talzian wards these days, she said. They what? There he went, sounding stupid again. She turned and looked at him, her eyes, which were the same rich shade of green as her skin, showing no amusement. I noticed it about three days ago. I saw one of them plain as day about three levels up, snooping around in the bazaar. Saw him, but couldn't sense him. Jax nodded. So how, how have you been? She tilted her head to one side, right Leku curling slightly at the end, whatever that meant. He wished he knew how to read the sophisticated subtext that Twi'lek head tales were said to convey. You can't tell? she asked. No, I, I can tell how you've been, she said cryptically, then jerked her head at the crevice. You want to check this out or what? He nodded and let her precede him into the dark gap. They'd gone maybe ten meters along its Stygian length, when Jax remembered that he'd thought of looking for her earlier. Laurent, he said quietly. About Tudin Sal. What about him? You know him. He came to us about three weeks ago. Got in touch with us through our contact at Sill's place. Sill's place, repeated Jax, a dive near the Westport. The Imani pub tender is an operative. And you trust him? I wouldn't have helped him find you if I didn't. He let that settle for a couple of beats. Did he tell you why he wanted to find me? He didn't want to find you, exactly. He wanted to find I-5, to repay an old debt, he said. He told me what he'd done, or rather what he failed to do. Her voice was grim, cold. It took Jax back to the night he and the Grey Paladin had met in the ruins of the Jedi Temple Complex amid the death and smoke and flame. She knew as well as he did that what Tudin Sal had failed to do may have been responsible, among many other things, for what they referred to as Flame Night, responsible for the deaths of all those innocent Jedi and Padawans. Did he tell you how he plans to repay that debt? She shot a glance back over her shoulder. I figured that was between him and I-5. No, not really. It's a lot more complicated. He was about to explain just how complicated, when the Force nearly yanked him off his feet for the second time that day. This time there was no question what direction the pull was coming from. The tether stretched away into the darkness of the crevice. He didn't have to ask if Laurent had felt it, too. The Twi'lek paladin was already in motion. Jax unclipped his lightsaber and hurried to keep up. Tesla stepped from the shadows of the fallen buttressing into light that was brilliant only in comparison with the midnight gloom he'd just traversed. The sight that met his eyes was confusing at first. Stretching away from him for perhaps a hundred meters was a debris field, roughly twenty or thirty meters wide, formed by the gap between two massive reservoirs. It made what he'd just passed through look like a well-tended garden path. Twisted lengths of duralumin and gigantic shards of transparent steel, some thicker than his body, lay like strange misshapen skeletons over and around chunks of masonry and plasticrete. The two reservoirs on either side were apparently in an advanced state of decay, and this bizarre landscape was the result. But there was more to it than that, Tesla sensed as he drew closer. The air here was charged with electrostatic energy that made every hair on his body stand on end and created strange, creeping halos around the pieces of debris. As he continued to move, he found it more difficult, as if the very molecules of the air conspired to push him back. He realized that this was a repulsor field, subtly tugging and twisting due to an everlasting state of flux, which had over the centuries warped the huge pieces of various metals into the agonized postures that lay all about him. Peering down the length of the cluttered swath, Tesla saw the source of the weird auroras. At the far end of the wreckage, a repulsor field generator thrummed, 
the subtle, light-bending contours of the region pressing against the canted walls of the buildings and coating them with shimmering iridescence. A faulty field generator would explain the state of flux that caused the visible effects. Under normal circumstances, the field would be invisible. He smiled. If his quarry had come in here thinking to escape him, he had erred grievously. That repulsor field would thrust back whatever approached too closely. The Jedi had come to a dead end, and the slice of darkness that marked an exit, which Tesla could just make out through the writhing veil of the energy barrier, might as well be on another world. He would never be able to enter it. Tesla started forward again, his lightsaber at the ready. He was halfway across the open expanse when he saw a figure emerge from the crumble of rock and steel to clamber up and stand atop a huge chunk of ferrocrete. Two things struck him simultaneously. One was that the figure thrown in relief against a rippling curtain of light was not Jack's Pavan, but a teenage human boy with a wild mane of pale hair. The other was that there were two field generators, one on each side of the canyon formed by the two reservoirs, At a point just beyond where his unknown target stood, the two fields overlapped, creating a sort of hole through which the boy doubtless intended to flee, unless Tesla did something to stop him. That he should stop him was obvious. No, this was not Jack's Pavan, but it was a force user of such power that he had drawn Tesla to him as a lodestone draws iron. In the moment of decision, Tesla flung himself into the air in a graceful force leap calculated to carry him within striking distance of his quarry. But instead of landing at the foot of the ferrocrete block, he was met in mid-leap by a resilient energy barrier that slapped him to the ground, hard. He fell between a gleaming shard of transparasteel and a twisted spur of durasteel buttress, only his finely honed reflexes and a sweep of his lightsaber saving him from serious injury. He thought for an instant that he must have connected with the repulsor field, but realized the impossibility of that as quickly as the thought occurred to him. His quarry had been standing at the edge of the field. The barrier he'd struck had met him several meters from that verge. He hadn't collided with the repulsor field. He had been struck down by the force, wielded by someone who had remarkable strength in it, someone he could not afford to let get away. He gathered himself and leapt again up into the charged air of the Erzatz Canyon. He lit upon the block of ferrocrete as lightly as a bird, ready to fire a bolt of force lightning at his opponent. His target was gone. Tesla reached out with his senses toward the interstices of the two repulsor fields. He found his prey with eyes and the force simultaneously. Two strides took him over the edge of the block of debris and down onto the ground behind it. Above him, the energy fields pulsed and flickered, making him feel as if fire gnats crawled over his body. But directly before him was a warped corridor of safety, a buffer zone in which the opposing fields canceled each other out. It writhed and shifted as if alive, a twisted gullet that bent light and refracted color. It conjured the image of two deep pools of troubled water kept back from each other by an invisible and uncertain barrier. How in the name of the Force was the boy able to navigate it? It hardly mattered. Tesla reached out with the Force and grasped the fleeing figure, yanking it to him. The boy fell backward, his tattered cloak fluttering about him. Tesla could feel the presence in his hand, almost as an actual tactile sensation. He tightened his Force grip and dragged the boy toward him. One pale hand reached out of the tattered cloak as if to try to arrest his headlong slide. Tesla smiled grimly and squeezed, then cried out in surprise and consternation as his feet were wrenched out from under him. He landed hard on his back, air driven from his lungs, and dropped his lightsaber. He took only a second to recover, by which time his quarry was gone again. The boy might be young, but he was obviously no novice. Tesla would not allow himself to be lulled into stupid complacency again. He picked up his lightsaber and hooked it to his belt, then went after the boy with both hands. This time he would not be deflected or caught off guard. 
he would capture this prize for his master. Failure was not an option. At the mouth of the energy corridor, he reached out anew with the force, using one hand to restrict his target's limbs and the other to haul him in. Concentrating his full attention on his task, he almost failed to catch the sudden movement of a five-meter-long section of fallen buttressing that swung suddenly toward his head. Tesla whirled, using both hands to deflect the deadly length of metal. In his frustration and anger, he did more than deflect it. He sent it flying. It hit the edge of one of the repulsor fields and exploded skyward. By the time it fell, hitting the ground with a shriek of metal on stone, Tesla was in motion, pursuing his elusive quarry into the wriggling corridor of energy. It was an unnerving place, an ever-changing passage of creeping light and shadow through which the external world could be seen as if through a thick wall of gel. Now the walls were rippling toward him, now they flew away like a sack, swollen by a breath of ionized air. Far above, forty stories perhaps, he could see a thin sliver of twilight sky. Then that was wiped from view in the rippling distortions of the walls. The sounds, too, were distracting, deafening screeches and roars, like metal sheets being ripped asunder, and his nostrils were constantly assaulted by the stench of ozone. He ran using the force to speed him along and deflect the billowing walls of the passageway. He tried nothing else until the boy was perhaps three meters ahead of him. Then he reached out and tripped him. Or tried to. It was as if the boy could read his intentions and knew just when to defend himself. This time he simply lifted his feet from the ground and somersaulted up the passage several meters before turning, touching down, and doing something that changed Tesla's mind utterly about the nature of their contest. The boy reached into the transparent energy fabric of the repulsor field, something that should have been impossible, and literally wrenched out a blazing ball of energy, molding the mass of writhing static between his hands as if it were made of modeling gel instead of highly charged energy particles. Then he flung the blindingly bright ball at Tesla. The Inquisitor whipped into a defensive position, erecting a barrier against the salvo. It seemed to matter little. It still took him by storm, knocking him backward almost to the entrance of the corridor. Only his own well-honed control of the force kept him from tumbling out of control. He jackknifed in the air and came at the boy again, this time with his lightsaber lit. He saw the boy's face clearly as he charged. The cowl of his cloak lay back on his narrow shoulders, his hair floated wildly about his head, and his eyes were huge with fear and fury. Feeling the youth's anger, Tesla was exultant. He had a fleeting thought of what a prize this child would make for his lord, but the proud thought was swamped by survival instinct and by his own wrath. He would not be bested by a mere boy. He roared aloud, using the force to amplify the sound, and saw the teenager's eyes widen farther. Tesla was ready when the second ball of repulsor energy came flying at him. He raised his lightsaber to parry it, and was blown upward into the heights of the field tunnel in a flash of searing crimson light. At a height of seven or eight meters, he collided with a ripple in the energy barrier that deflected him downward again with just as much force. He came down on the gritty Duracrete surface face first, only just gathering the presence of mind to wrap the force around him like a cocoon. It was all that kept him from breaking bones. He levitated back to his feet, enraged, and threw back his own cowl. Fool, he roared at the retreating form. I offer you freedom, and you choose to hide with the vermin. The youth hesitated and turned. You're an inquisitor. His voice came to Tesla's ears, warped and tortured by the skittering, moaning sounds of the warring repulsor fields. So could you be with your power. The boy's unspoken scorn was immediate and powerful, as if it, like his unlikely ability, was fed by the force. He started to turn away. Return with me or die. The boy turned back, 
his gaze meeting Tesla's so strongly that the Inquisitor heard it as a rending sound in his head and felt it as a searing pain behind his eyes. His heart pounded, his breath was suddenly constricted. He felt like a lidded vessel filling with some white-hot substance until it must surely burst. The fire gnats were crawling over him again, inflaming every nerve in his body. Leave me alone, the boy said quietly. And the words sounded in Tesla's head, each one like an icy dagger in his paralyzed brain. Just leave me alone. Then suddenly he was free. He stumbled to his knees, fury and humiliation sweeping through him in waves. Tesla lifted both hands and fired a bolt of force lightning at the corridor just above the boy's head, uncaring of the result. If the wretch would rather die than be taken by an inquisitor, then so be it. The lightning struck the rippling surface and bifurcated, each sizzling lash recoiling to strike again centimeters apart. They twinned again, then quadrupled. Tesla cut off the flow of force lightning from his body, but it had little, if any, effect. Suddenly, the corridor was filled with a dozen random lightning strikes, then twice that many. They were advancing on him in a trenchant storm, eating up the passageway before him. He couldn't see what had happened to the boy. His figure was lost in the erratic pulses of light. Tesla threw up a defensive barrier and backed swiftly away from the advancing lightning. Surely with its motive energy cut off, it would soon fade. He kept moving, staying just ahead of the searing, draining discharges, until he was certain the exit must be directly behind him. He glanced over his shoulder. It was not. In fact, only a meter or two farther along the passage, what had been an open passageway, seemed to end in a pocket of charged and warped air. He hesitated, heart thudding. How was this possible? The interstice in which he stood was formed by a cancellation effect. The two fields overlap was unstable, but the instability was linear. There was no way the two opposing fields could meet and meld in that way. No power that could. He peered beyond the barrier, through the fluctuations in the cul-de-sac. Beyond them, out in the open debris field, he saw a lone figure standing atop a slab of Faro Creek a figure with a bright mane of pale hair, rippling and warping as if viewed beneath the surface of a storm-tossed sea. The dance of energy on the left side of his face alerted Tesla to the fact that he had hesitated too long. He had barely enough time to stiffen his force shield against the lightning before it struck, exploding the tiny pocket of relative calm in which he stood. When Jax first emerged from the cut into what passed for daylight at the level of the city, he wasn't sure what he was seeing. At the far end of the plaza, between the walls of two massive buildings, a pair of indistinct figures struggled within what looked like a writhing bowl of transparent, gelatinous light. It looked like the interstice between two force fields, but Jax had never encountered such a thing except in theory. He glanced at Laurent, who gave the Twi'lek equivalent of a shrug, both Leku lifting slightly before settling again, the shorter one just brushing her shoulders. That both combatants possessed the force in abundance was obvious. They knocked each other off their respective feet several times before one hurled a ball of such brightness at the other that it was painful for Jax to look at it, even from meters away. Laurent stopped in mid-stride, peering at the unstable slot between the fields. What was that? It didn't look like force lightning. A second charged ball erupted toward the figure nearest the entrance to the flux. This time the would-be victim met it with his lightsaber. His bright, crimson lightsaber. Sith, hissed Jax under his breath as the repulsor fields lit up like a festival barge. Or an inquisitor. Then who's the other guy? I'd love to know. Jax activated his lightsaber and moved cautiously toward the fray, keeping low and moving from cover to cover, Laurent at his back. They had reached a particularly large block of ferrocrete when the fault between the two fields erupted in a fitful blaze of blue-white light that seemed to grow exponentially. Now that is force lightning, Jax murmured. From the Sith? Must be. 
The other one just disappeared. The other one reappeared suddenly, shooting out through the narrow interstice at a height of at least two stories. Clear of the repulsor fields, he executed a perfect somersault in midair and landed on the slab of ferrocrete beside which Jax and Loranth sheltered. With a motion that suggested the closing of a curtain, the youth, for he couldn't have been more than about fifteen or sixteen, closed the lips of the flux zone, sealing the Sith within. A heartbeat or two later, the fields blazed brighter than the noonday sun on Coruscant's uppermost levels, and gave a sound that made Jax think the sky was splitting. The concussion hurt his ears and buffeted him even in the lee of the ferrocrete block, and it knocked the boy from his high perch to the ground. He wasn't unconscious when Jax and Loranth got to him, but he was stunned. Aware of the other's obvious power, Jax projected feelings of calm as he knelt beside him. That was a pretty neat trick you did with that field back there, Jack said mildly. Is that dead end going to last much longer? The boy blinked and shook his head. Then we'd better get you out of here. That Inquisitor's going to be pretty mad when he comes to. If he's still alive, Loranth murmured. Who are you? The boy asked, confusion and fear intertwining in his voice and invading his gray eyes. Jax held his lightsaber up between them, then deactivated it. I'm a Jedi Knight, he said. My name is Jax. Six. Jax and Laurent stopped to reconnoiter in the confluence of corridors where they'd met on their way to the Force eruption. The boy, who'd mumbled that his name was Kaj, seemed less dazed now. His eyes kept going to Jax's lightsaber. Which way from here? Loranth asked, jerking her head toward the alcove terminus of the shaft she'd descended earlier. That comes out in Plautical, near the heart of it, in fact. If the Inquisitors are looking for our friend, the market might offer us the best cover. How did you come down? Jax grimaced. I barely remember. Kaj here sort of swept me off my feet. If you're a Jedi, where's your lightsaber? Loranth and Jax turned in unison to look at the boy. He actually blushed. Strictly speaking, Laurent told him, I'm a gray paladin. We have a somewhat different approach to a few things, lightsabers being one of them. A gray paladin isn't married to a particular weapon. We simply use the force through whatever tool we prefer. I like blasters. She patted the pair holstered at her thighs. Though I've been known to use a vibroblade from time to time. The boy turned his eyes to Jack's. Your lightsaber is red. His was red. He flicked his gaze back the way they'd come. How do I know you're really Jedi? Either of you. How do I know you're not Inquisitors? Jax could feel the uncertainty and fear building up behind the pale eyes. Building toward panic, he'd already seen what this Force prodigy could do when panicked. I'm not, he said. Touch me. Use the force to reach out and read me. I won't stop you. He saw Laurent's eyes widen just before he closed his own and opened himself to this strange boy. He felt her trepidation as a cascade of cold lines down his back, felt the boy's tentative touch as a cool tendril of uncertainty. Blue. The force manifested in Kaj as amorphous blobs blue tending toward violet. Jack saw them in his mind's eye, reaching out for him, encircling him, probing. After a moment, the touch was withdrawn, and he opened his eyes to see the boy looking at him, perplexed. What did you sense? There's no anger in you, no rage. I have so much, and I have to fight it so hard sometimes. And he... Again, the flicker of attention back toward the debris field with its possibly dead Inquisitor. He was like a furnace. He burned with it. Why are you so different? Because I'm a Jedi, Jax answered him. Our Inquisitor friend is... something else. A Sith? Jax glanced at Loranth. What do you know about the Sith? He asked Kaj. The boy shrugged. Legends. 
myths? Well, there are all kinds of Sith. As far as I know, an Inquisitor isn't actually a Sith, but they do use red lightsabers. It's a function of the crystal that's used. Different crystals produce different colors. So, it's a choice you make. Jax and Loranth traded glances. Yes, Jack said. Usually. Only I didn't choose this lightsaber. The one I had, the one I built and trained with, was destroyed. This one, he patted the hilt, was given to me by someone who knew I needed one. Loranth moved restively. I hate to break this up, but we have a logistical problem. Had to get Kaj onto friendly turf. Yes, but which friendly turf? Jax met her eyes, which made his stomach feel strange. I can take him back with me, or you can smuggle him to Taizan Yemen. Yemen has a lot on his plate, the Twi'lek said. I can't conscionably give him yet another consideration without asking. Kaj, who'd been sitting against a pile of rubble, scrambled to his feet. I'm not a consideration. I'm a Jedi. At least, I want to be a Jedi, he amended when the weight of dual gazes fell on him. I want to be trained. I want it to learn to use the Force, to control it instead of having it burn through me like it does. It, it scares me sometimes, the way I feel. The way it feels. He ran down, his hands tugging at his cloak, his eyes pleading. He looked and sounded so very young and fragile, which made what he'd done to the Inquisitor back there all the more astonishing. I-5's words came back to Jax at that moment, what the droid had said about Jax being needed to train the next generation of Jedi. Perhaps that need was already presenting itself. We'll take him to the Conapt he told Loranth, but be sure to give Yemun a full report. Maybe it's best for him to train with you, learn the ways of the paladins. Maybe it's best he gets the high points of both philosophies, said Loranth. Circumstances being what they are, mutual exclusivity is a luxury the Jedi can't afford. She was right, of course. They were stronger together than apart, which brought Jax's mind forcibly around to the fact of her leaving their team. He opened his mouth to say something about it, to suggest that she come back. But she was already moving into the alcove, craning her long, graceful neck to scan the vertical shaft with its inset hand and footholds. She flicked her green gaze back to Kaj. Can you do a controlled leap when you're not under attack? She asked. And Jax thought that her lips curled slightly at the corners. The boy moved to peer up the ferrocrete tube. He nodded. I think so. At least I've leapt as high as that cross shaft. He pointed straight up. Jax joined them in the small access, following the boy's gesture to a point roughly ten meters up, where a durasteel catwalk skirted the shaft, having its diameter. Good, Loranth said. She drew one of her blasters. I'll go first. Follow me up. She leapt reaching the metal platform easily and lighting on it with a soft tap of her booted feet. Kaj glanced at Jax, who nodded encouragingly, then followed, overshooting the catwalk by almost a meter. Laurent snagged his cloak and reeled him in before leaping away to a higher perch. Jax took that as his cue to move and joined Kaj on the catwalk. The boy peered at him in the twilight gloom, his eyes betraying fear. Won't they feel us? The Inquisitors, I mean. Won't they feel us using the Force? Probably. But they certainly felt that big explosion you set off back there, and hopefully that's where they'll concentrate. It'll take only a few seconds to reach the bazaar, and once we're there, we can blend in. Now go on up. Lorant is waiting for you. They got him back to Pelota Place without incident. The market was, in fact, curiously empty of Imperial presence. And Jax, despite stretching to the limit of his Force senses, detected not even an Inquisitor, or rather the hole in the Force that would suggest the use of a Tauzin cloak, such as some of the Inquisitors used to hide their presence from other Force sensitives. Jax was surprised when Loranth accompanied them all the way to the Conapt. 
Renan and I-5 were both connected to the hollow net when they entered the living area. Renan glanced up with obvious surprise, whether at seeing Loranth or their guest, or both, Jax couldn't say. I-5's photoreceptors blinked once, then settled on Kaj. Are DJ and Dan around? Jax asked. DJ Adware is out, said I-5 in his obedient protocol droid voice. Dendur is in his room composing a correspondence. Jax smiled at how jarring it was to have this particular protocol droid behaving in ways that were normal for a protocol droid. It's all right, I-5. Kaj is... Kaj is a friend. And he's a Force-sensitive. He just took down an Inquisitor single-handedly and unarmed. He did what? Dendur stood in the doorway to his quarters, his already large eyes looking huge in the wash of full-spectrum light from the room's cleverly concealed indirect illumination. Kaj, this is Dendur, a member of our team. The short, stocky Celestin came farther into the room, his eyes on the newcomer. Oh, great, sure. Let's make polite introductions while every Imperial stormtrooper on Coruscant is out looking for him. Jax shook his head. Den... Didn't you hear what I said? Yeah, I heard what you... Kaj is a potential Jedi, said Jax patiently. The Inquisitor was after him. He didn't get him. That's good news. Good news? He's a potential time bomb, Jax. Can't you... He cut off as I-5's metal hand came down on his shoulder. Den, it's rude to talk over someone as if they weren't there. I know, people do it to me all the time. What Jax is telling us is that the Emperor failed to get yet another valuable prize. For all his trying, he has failed to capture Jax, and now he's failed to capture our new friend. The droid tilted his head toward the boy, who blinked. Uh, Kaj said. Kajen. Kajen Savaros. Jax steered Kaj around the Vesvalet light sculpture that Deja had installed in their living space, and into the seating area. He sat him down in a form chair, then moved to sit on one corner of the couch facing him. Are you hungry, Kaj? Thirsty? It can't be easy living out there on the street like that. I'm starved, actually. I'd stolen some stuff from the market, but the Inquisitor smoked me out before I could eat much of it. Jack started to rise, but I-5 waved him down. Allow me. Loranth, would you also like some refreshment? The Twi'lek opened her mouth, glanced at the droid then simply nodded and followed him over to the beverage dispenser. The Inquisitors are after you too? Kaj asked Jax, pulling his eyes from the light sculpture's kinetic, ever-changing display. Because you're a Jedi? That's the official reason, I guess. It's really a lot more complicated than that. What about you? How long have you been dodging Inquisitors? Since I turned 15, six weeks ago. That was when the Force really woke up in me. Before that, I was just another street kid who occasionally made strange things happen. But you haven't always lived on Coruscant. Kaj shook his head, his eyes lighting up at the sight of the plate of Ghibli fruit and a tall glass of some sort of red tea that I-5 carried toward him on a tray. One of I-5's soothing concoctions, Jax figured. The boy accepted the food and took a healthy bite before answering Jax's implied question. I got here about, oh, seven months ago, I guess, from Mahaley. The expression on his face froze, and Jax could feel the cold, swift stab of grief that lay behind it. My parents' farm was destroyed by Imperial troops. My father was a local elder. They wanted to make an example of him, showed that they were the leaders now. So they sacked the farm and drove us off it. Mother and father put me on a transport to Coruscant, hoping... He shrugged, swallowing a mouthful of fruit. I'm not sure what they were hoping. My parents knew I was different. Since I was a baby, I'd occasionally, like I said, make strange things happen. You know, levitate something to make it come to me, that sort of thing. He drank most of the tea in a single gulp. They knew the Jedi Temple was gone, but I think my mother was hoping I might find someone. His eyes sought Jax's. 
then moved to Laurent, who had come back into the room behind I-5. Someone who would train you. Jax finished. Train who to do what? Dijadware swept into the room, unwinding a long, pale scarf of translucent golden synth silk from her deep crimson hair, which blazed when the light hit it. Jax felt his throat constrict and used a tendril of the force to fend off the effects of Deja's sensual aura. At first he thought she must have caught something of the tenor of their discussion, and that concern had caused an unconscious spike in her pheromones. Then he realized that her gaze was not on Kaj, but on Laurent. The Twi'lek didn't so much as twitch a muscle, but she disappeared from Jax's sense of the force almost as effectively as if she'd put on Tauzin scale armor. I need to report to Yimon, she said. Let me know what you decide, Jax. Goodbye, Kaj. May the force be with you. You found a good teacher. She glided past Deja without so much as a glance. Jax opened his mouth to call after her, but couldn't think of anything to say. He shrugged mentally. That was just Laurent's way. He should be used to it by now. Report what to Yimon? Deja asked, coming farther into the room, settling the scarf about her shoulders. Decide what? What's she talking about? Den, who'd been hovering between anteroom and living area, scuttled quickly out of her way and took a seat next to Jax on the couch. Only when she'd rounded the chair Kaj was sitting in did her eyes fall on him. She smiled, radiantly, her smile like a benediction. Kaj's eyes widened, then flicked toward Jax as if seeking instructions. You're a Celtron, he said with something like awe in his voice. Oh, boy, Den muttered. Jax elbowed him. Deja, this is Kajin Savaros from Mahaley. He just had a narrow escape from an Inquisitor. Loranth and I were lucky enough to have witnessed Kaj's powerful use of the Force in defeating that Inquisitor. Alone. Unarmed. Deja drew in a deep breath and exhaled, her eyes meeting Kaj's. Remarkable. Then, are you a Jedi? I want to be. I'm hoping Jax will teach me. Deja's regard swung to Jax. That's what you meant then. Teach him to become a Jedi. You want to take him on as a Padawan. There, you see, it's just like I-5 said. If the Jedi Order is to be rebuilt, you'll have to have a hand in it. Surely you can see that now. I wasn't blind to it before, said Jax gently. I was just aware that there are other priorities. What could be more important than that, Deja demanded. What could be a more valuable thing for you to do than to train this young man? She was trying to make points with him by flattery, of course, Jax realized, trying to convince him to stay out of Tudin Sal's plottings. He smiled, warmed by the fact that she cared so much for him. Den growled. What a bunch of builders, Scoot. I-5 stirred and made his throat-clearing sound. His sudden reappearance in the conversation startled Kaj. Jax saw the boy's reaction as a sudden appearance of a multitude of force spikes that darted out and receded as soon as he registered the source of the sound and movement. Jax frowned. That had been an involuntary reflex. Kajin Savaros was wearing the force awfully close to the surface. If it was that easy for Jax to sense him, how much easier would it be for an Inquisitor? While I agree with Deja Duare in principle, I-5 said, it does seem to me that in light of the way Kaj came to be among us, we should be prepared to move him and ourselves as well, if it becomes necessary. Why would it become necessary? asked Deja, looking from Jax to the droid to Kaj. Maybe you didn't hear Jax clearly, Deja said Dan acerbically. Kajin here defeated an Inquisitor, which probably means that the entire College of Sith flunkies is about to come down on our heads. He just swung around to look at Kaj. But you killed him, surely. I... I don't know, Kaj stammered, then looked to Jax. Is there a way we can tell? 
Jax shook his head. All I can tell you is that he wasn't conscious when we left the area. I didn't detect any force threads from him at any rate. Force threads? repeated Koch. Metaphorically speaking. What difference does it make if he's dead? Den asked sharply. The Inquisitors aren't loners. They stay connected to their boss. If you killed him, then he just became a big fat blank spot on Vader's sensors. And if he's still alive, he'll go scurrying back to his lord and master to make a full report. He's already a big fat blank spot, Den, Jax explained. Lorenz told me that the Inquisitors have started using some sort of Tauzin byproduct to block detection. How much danger do you think we're in? Deja asked. No more than we were before. But I do need to start Kajin's training. Good, said I-5. That should give you incentive to complete the lightsaber you've been working on. And if we can find another crystal, you might even be able to retrofit the lightsaber you're carrying now to emit a less sanguinary hue. Deja laughed, the sound trilling and warm. I resent that remark, she said without rancor. I find crimson a most appealing color. Don't you, Kajin? She cocked her head pertly to one side sending a thick lock of burgundy-colored hair over one eye. The boy nodded mutely. Oh, please. Den slid off the couch and disappeared into his room. After a moment, I-5 followed him. Jax looked at Koch. The boy's eyes were still on Deja, but they seemed unfocused, vague. You up for starting your career as a Padawan? Jax asked. The boy shook himself visibly. I'm pretty tired. Is there some place I could sleep for a while? Jax took Kodge to the sleep alcove in his own quarters and bedded him down, hoping he wouldn't have any forced dreams. With power like Kajin Savaros had shown, a forced dream could wreak havoc on their homestead. He'd soft-pedaled that just now, he realized, and he said nothing of his concern to Deja when he returned to the living room to find her sitting in the chair Kodge had lately occupied. This is a good thing, isn't it, Jax? This boy? Her eyes were eloquent with the need to be reassured. It's a very good thing. Once he learns to use his ability, well, I can only imagine the sort of things he'll be able to do. You should have seen him, Deja. He was nothing short of astounding. I've never seen anyone do what he did. Just by instinct, I think. He handled repulsor energy as if it were malleable. Clay in a sculptor's hands. Or light? She smiled up at him, obviously thinking of her late partner, whose light sculptures had been the pride of Coruscant's elite collectors, and to whom she'd been completely devoted. That devotion was an unusual trait in a Zeltron. As a species, they were naturally inclined to swift, passionate relationships, torrid love affairs, brief obsessions. Deja was different, and Jax suspected at times that she had not completely transferred her devotion from Vess Volette to him, that beneath her air of sultry flirtation lurked a deeper current of mourning. He shook the thought away. He was a Jedi. He didn't want her to transfer her devotion to him. It was dangerous to both of them. But he answered dutifully and with a smile, despite the chilling thought. Like light. In fact, it looked as if he were molding light in his hands. Then he hurled it like a weapon. He manipulated the repulsor fields as if they were curtains made of this. He moved closer to her chair to lift a corner of the synth silk scarf that lay in soft folds over her shoulder. She gazed up at him raptly, eyes bright, lips parted. A frisson of something indescribable tickled the back of Jax's neck. He dropped the scarf. And he's only just turned fifteen, he said quickly, stepping back from the chair and the female in it. He has no training, no formal practice in how to control the force, only his instinct, and his instinct is apparently very good. He must be very powerful, Deja murmured, lowering her eyes. Yes. Yes, I can see. That much raw power would have to be trained, controlled, channeled. 
She smiled again and shook her head, sending the light dancing through her hair. You certainly have your work cut out for you, young Jedi Master. Jax flushed. I'm not a Jedi Master. Barely a Jedi Knight. But you're right. I do have my work cut out for me. I'm going to have to train Kajin Savaros to be a Jedi, whether I'm up to it or not. What's the matter with you? At the sound of the mechanical voice, Den turned to find that I-5 had entered his room on silent, droid feet. What's the matter with me? I was going to ask what you thought was the matter with everybody else around here. Well, not everybody. Just Jax and... Well, you, not to put too fine a point on it. Ah, of course there's never anything wrong with you, is there? You're Den Durr, the journalist. You observe all and are touched by nothing. Well, that took the scathing prize. Look, you mean-spirited bucket of bolts. I've never claimed to be untouched or completely objective or any of that nonsense. Any journalist who claims he's impartial or uncaring or uninvolved has got hash for brains, is lying to himself and the universal mind, and is betraying the very purpose for which he became a journalist in the first place. A jaded journalist is a journalist who should frip and retire. He paused to take a breath. I should frip and retire. I-5 managed to make his stationary metal eyebrow ridges look as if they had arched in feigned surprise. Really? I should say you're too far from jaded for that. Something has obviously set you in a high dudgeon. Den stared at the droid, wondering if this was a golden opportunity to spill his guts and receive reassurance. Or just a solid brass opportunity to look like a complete idiot. It's that Duare woman. She's... She's... Yes, yes, I caught the childish mutterings. That's nothing new. This is. Den crossed to his bed and threw himself onto it, folding his hands behind his head and staring up at the Duracrete ceiling. It had, at some point in its existence, been painted a soothing shade of gray-green that reminded him of the color of the cavern ceilings back home on Sullust. He could be there, he realized, for the thousandth time reclining on a form couch in his own cave, having a peaceful conversation with I.R., and not in enemy territory hiding out in a dive, staring with nostalgia at a ceiling, and having a frustrating dialogue with a protocol droid. What had he been thinking when he decided to stay here on Coruscant? Oh, well, he knew what he'd been thinking, that I-5 would never leave Jax, and that he would never leave I-5. Jax was Five's... What, adopted nephew? Adopted son? How twisted was that? No more twisted, he supposed, than that his best friend in the whole universe was made of metal and had a synaptic grid network instead of a cerebral cortex. Well, said his best friend in the whole universe, looking and sounding arch. Den sat up. In case you hadn't noticed, our young Jedi has brought home a stray human. A potentially dangerous stray human. I don't know if you caught the subtext of what Jax was saying, or rather trying not to say, but I did. The boy is being sought by the Inquis- Not that. We're being sought by the Inquisitors. The boy is freakishly powerful and untrained. I-5 cocked his head to one side. He's a raw talent, yes. Den sighed. Are you being intentionally obtuse, Five, or have you fried some capacitors? Jax and Laurent are very careful about when and how they use the Force, around our neighborhood especially. Our house guest apparently drew the Inquisitor to him through an injudicious use of the Force. Who's to say you won't suffer a similar breach of protocol here? Jax. Den opened his mouth to protest that Jax was not omniscient, but I-5 raised a hand. Trust, Den. This whole team that Jax has gathered around him is based on trust. If Jax thinks he can train this boy, then I have to trust that he can. Den snorted. Trust? You think you can trust Renan or Dejo or Tudensal? No, not even as far as I could throw them, which would be a considerable distance, actually. But every one of us knows that we can trust Jax. He's the core, the heart. All our threads connect to him. Of course, you also know that you can trust me, and I know that I can trust you. But in the final analysis, 
It's our trust in Jax that holds us together. Den swung his legs off the bed and leaned closer to the droid, his mind reaching for something he'd been trying to articulate for some time. But can we trust him, Five? Can we trust him when she's working on him, reading his emotions, playing to them, maybe manipulating him? By she, you mean Dija Dware, of course. Who else? She's a Zeltron, Five. I'm not saying she's got ulterior motives when it comes to our Jedi. Her motives are perfectly clear. She wants him. I just think she's a distraction. And under the circumstances, Jax can't afford a distraction like that. We can't afford a distraction like that. I-5's metal face was as unreadable as it was supposed to be. Jax has noted, as have I, that Deja does not seem to be a normal Zeltron. She seems capable of a longer emotional attention span, for one thing and in Jax's estimation, capable of a surprising amount of loyalty. Jax would remind you that she could be back on Zeltros or some other world far removed from the Empire's dark heart. She has chosen to remain here with us instead. He would also remind you that she has been very useful both in our relations with Paul House and with the various informants, willing or otherwise, that we have occasion to use. I know what Jax would remind me of, thank you. I'm just surprised that you're reminding me, too. Are you? Well, something I will assuredly remind you of is that Dija Dware agrees with you about Tudin Sal and his plan to terminate Emperor Palpatine. I'm surprised you haven't seized on that as a means to forge an alliance with her. On that note, the droid turned on his metal heel and exited the room, leaving Den to ponder his last words. Forge an alliance with Dija Dware? Could be useful, he supposed. Might even occasion him to undercut her obvious attempts to slip into a more intimate relationship with Jax. He thought about it for a while. But contemplating a possible physical relationship between Jax Pavan and Dija Dware only made him lonely for I.R. Marath. He got up from the bed and crossed to his workstation, more determined than ever to contact her. He had half a letter composed already, and now he was certain he would send it. Would find out if the beautiful Celestin singer was still awaiting him on their homeworld. Renan slouched in the form chair at his workstation, mulling over the last half hour's worth of conversations he had eavesdropped on. Oh, he'd certainly not been in hiding. With as much notice as the others paid him, he could hide in plain sight. What was that Kuba's expression? An insect on the wall, an arthropod on the ceiling, something like that. At any rate, something that was right in front of everyone's nose, yet went completely unnoticed. Not that he was complaining. His social invisibility had given him an unprecedented opportunity to observe interactions that he might not have overheard if he had been a notable entity. What did he observe? He cataloged the items carefully, ticking them off in his mind. There was the growing antagonism between the Zeltron female and Den Dur, of course. Well, at least Den's antagonism toward her. He had the feeling that Dija Dware found the Celestin more amusing than annoying. No accounting for taste. There was the obvious tension between Loranth Tarak and Dija Dware. Now that was interesting. Dija was still angling for the Jedi. Nothing new there but now she seemed to be casting her net at the younger adept as well. Was that merely a reflex, or did she do it to a purpose? Then there was the boy. He clearly had everyone spooked. Understandable. Renan was feeling far from sanguine about his sudden appearance himself, and truthfully he was torn. Instinct told him that the boy represented either a magnificent opportunity or a potential disaster, which it was largely depended on how well the youngling responded to Jax Pavan's attempts to educate him. He was certainly an intriguing variable. What might be made of a Force-sensitive of such strength that he could overcome an armed, Sith-trained Inquisitor? Renan was turning these thoughts over pleasantly in his head, when an idea occurred to him that was so chilling, he very nearly swooned. What if it was all a setup. What if the Mahalian boy had been planted where Jax Pavan would notice him, find him, 
bring him home. What if Kajin Savaros was a mole? Breathing gustily enough to rattle his nose tusks, the Elumen turned back to his workstation and connected to the holonet. It would cost an extravagant amount, but he would make certain that when he reached the Westport, there would be a ship to take him away from Coruscant at a moment's notice. He made his travel plans hurriedly, while in the back of his mind, considering ways he could accelerate his search for the Bota. 7. Jax started Kaja's training the next day, with a series of meditations geared toward getting the boy in touch with his own center. He recognized the great difficulty of what he'd set himself up to do. He had trained as a Jedi since the age of two, spent years in meditation and study of Jedi history, Jedi philosophy, Jedi strategy. He had spent months and months in combat training, which consisted largely of learning the defensive forms from Shicho to Juyo. He had spent countless hours on mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual control. There was obviously no way to teach Kaj all of that in the compressed amount of time they might have and there was no way to teach it at all without using the Force. He had to find a solution to that problem somehow, but at the moment as he watched Kaj sit cross-legged, attempting to master his breathing and control his heart rate, he could think of none. The Jedi have a code that we live by, Jack said now, his voice soft, calming. He sat opposite Kaj on a woven mat in his room in a meditative posture, head up, eyes closed, hands lying open on his knees. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no death, there is the force. He felt the boy stir and remembered his first real meditation on the Jedi mantra. He had been about six, and the words which he had heard over and over again for four years, had suddenly struck him and resonated, and raised no end of questions. Ask, Jack said. There is no death? What do you know of the Force? Jax asked in return. What have you heard or been told? Kaj looked uncertain. I know only that it moves through me, sometimes like a quiet stream, sometimes like a raging river. I've heard only that its power can be channeled. Jax listened carefully to the words the boy used to describe that which he possessed but barely understood. The streams and rivers flow into a great ocean. That ocean is the force. It is the end of all journeys. There was a moment of silence in which Kaj digested what Jax had said and in which Jax kicked himself several times for the simplistic metaphor. He'd been trying to follow Kaj's lead. I'm from a farming family, the boy said. I understand what water means, how it permeates everything, how its presence gives life and its absence brings death. Is that what the Force is like? You tell me, Jax said. Is that what it's like for you? Again, the boy paused for thought. Yes. And no. I mean, sometimes it's like that. If I just sort of swim in it, I guess. But when I try so hard not to let it out, then it's like water behind a dam, building up, building up, wanting to be let out. And that's when it gets away from me. Then I think it's more like fire. It burns. Jax pondered that. He'd never experienced the Force that way himself, nor had he ever heard anyone describe experiencing the Force that way. He wondered if the dichotomous images were partly explained by the fact that Kaj had had no early training, that his talent had grown up like a wild thing, untrammeled and free, a late bloomer compared with most. The visualization exercises that every young Padawan was taught to help him or her harness the Force were new to Kajin Savaros just as teaching them was new to Jack's Pavan. Right now, try to think of the force as water, he said. Water you can channel. 
You're, you're the high mountain lake in which the river starts. You determine how fast it flows, where it channels and erodes, whether it sings or roars. If you can learn to turn the water, you can keep it from transmuting into fire. You can control it. Now, can you see the lake? Ah, uh, Kaj said. Then suddenly, as if in discovery. Yes. Yes, I can see the lake. Good. Let's follow the river. They went on like that for some time. Hours, in fact, during which Jax was certain Kaj would become bored or sleepy or confused and impatient. He did none of those things. He followed his river, making it go here and there, rise and fall, ripple and sing, without ever allowing it to become a whitewater rapid. After a time, Jax set a Sunteran song ball out on the floor between them, and had Kaj perform the placid, soothing ritual of using the merest tendril of the force to roll the ball back and forth between them. As they did this, they recited the Jedi Code as a call and response. The ball, which was made of a rare titanium alloy of great tensile strength, was composed of a sphere within a sphere. The two touched as the thing moved, creating a low, sonorous note, that rose and fell like the breathing of an immense flute. Jax gave the ball the barest nudge with the force, rolling it to Kaj. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, said Kaj, rolling it back. There is knowledge, there is no passion, there is serenity. There is no death, there is the force. The boy had hesitated at first, sometimes forgetting the words, sometimes unable to push the ball in the right direction. But he had mastered it quickly, as someone with the reflexes of a youth rather than a toddler can. And now the ball sang between them in the weaving of Jax's threads and the gentle push of Kaja's currents. It was a safe enough exercise. Even an inquisitor standing in the street below their airy would have trouble reading the gentle warp, woof, and tidal surge of the schoolroom practice. But what they would do when more rigorous training was called for, Jax couldn't yet imagine. Sooner or later, he would have to train Kaj to control his impulses in the heat of combat, and that would take a good deal more than gentle nudging. Still, it was all in all a good start. Jax was congratulating himself when Deja tapped at the door, then entered without waiting to be admitted. Simultaneously, the song ball shot past Jax, barely missing his right thigh, and hit the wall behind him with a resounding crack and a loud thrum of the inner resonator sphere. Deja leapt back a step with a high-pitched squeak. Kaj, the river, mind the currents, said Jax, keeping his voice pitched low, but the boy was already on his feet, his composure shattered to pieces. I, I'm sorry, he stammered. No, I'm sorry, Deja said contritely. I was just wondering if you were hungry. You've been in here for hours. I thought maybe you could use a break. Jax glanced from her to Kaj, whose face had gone almost as red as the Zeltrons. He knew he should send Deja away and make Kaj resume his meditations. It's what his own master would have done. Master Peel had not been a grim authoritarian by any means, but had known that a Padawan must learn early how to retrieve lost composure or shattered concentration. He opened his mouth to say the words, We have more work to do. But a look at Deja's face stopped them in his throat. Instead, he nodded. You're right. We've been at this a long time. I'm sure Kaj could use a break and a good meal. Right, Kaj? The boy nodded mutely, his eyes never leaving the Zeltron. Well, come on, then, she said pertly, and curled a finger at Kaj before disappearing through the door. Kaj scrambled after her, giving Jax an apologetic sidewise glance. It won't happen again, he murmured. Not true, Jax thought. With Deja around, it most likely would. And if it did... Jax crossed the room and picked up the now slightly dented song ball. The plasticrete wall, 
supposedly resilient up to a metric ton of pressure, had sustained equal damage. And who knew how loud the roar of that whitewater surge had been? Jax had been deep in his own meditation, and he had felt it. His thighs still tingled with the residual energy. In the outer room, Deja uttered a throaty laugh that was followed by a diffident echo from Koch. Something stirred uneasily beneath Jax's breastbone, something he couldn't quite put a name to. One of the first things he was going to have to teach Kajin Savaros, he decided, was how to block, or at least filter, Deja Duare's heady perfume. Renan had no reasonable expectation that the droid would divulge any information about the Bota, but on the off chance that some vestige of his original programming had survived Lorne Pavan's tinkering, he asked anyway. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, as the humans said. So when Renan and I-5 were alone in the workstation alcove, the Elumen decided there would be no better time. Everyone else seemed to be engaged in the current pursuit of smuggling a Togruten female with nascent force abilities off-world via the UML. He thought of his travel arrangements, of how easy it would be to simply pack up and leave. Were it not for the arrival of the force prodigy, and the fact that Renan had been less than aggressive in his search for the Bota. It wouldn't do to be slavish in sticking to a timetable. That sort of tunnel vision could lead to missed opportunity, like the one he was now presented with. Deciding that honesty, or something close to it, was the best policy, Renan seized the moment, sat back in his workstation form chair, and said, I am troubled by the amount of attention that may soon be trained upon us. After a moment of hesitation, I-5 disengaged from whatever online information he had been pursuing, and responded, Really? Why is that? Why is that? Renan repeated. I should think that would be obvious, particularly to you. He ticked the reasons off on his long, spatulate fingers. Our houseguest is a Force-sensitive. That makes him a prime target for Lord Vader's continued purges. He has been pursued by an Inquisitor, ergo... He has drawn attention to himself. Ergo, Vader cannot help but know of his existence. He has killed an Inquisitor. We don't know that for a fact, I-5 said with maddening imperturbability. Then he's injured one at the very least. And he drew Laranth and Jax into his association. How can you possibly think that we are not at increased risk of exposure? I can because one thing has not changed. Vader has no more information about us or our activities or location as a result of Kajin's appearance than he had previously. I-5 gestured at the Holonet link. I monitor several different bands that convey classified intel, and none of them has given me any reason to suspect otherwise. Trust me, so far, Vader knows nothing of this. He does, if his Inquisitor saw Jax and Laranth come to the boy's rescue. A moment ago said the droid dryly. The Inquisitor was dead. He can have hardly observed anything in that state. Renan kept calm. If he was only injured, he might have seen Jax and Laranth save the boy. At the time that Jax and Laranth arrived on the scene, the Inquisitor was being blown sky high by a blast of repulsor energy. Jax was blinded standing outside looking into the blast. I can't imagine what the Inquisitor might have seen from inside the blast zone, but I doubt it was Jax and Laranth. The stupid droid was apparently bent on being utterly uncooperative. Renan strove for composure. But he sensed them, surely. He would have known other Jedi were involved. Perhaps he did. But he was incapacitated, or so Jax sensed. How do we know that wasn't the Tao Zin effect? The droid had to think about that, and Renan felt absurdly pleased. Jax has told me, I-5 said, that once you know what to expect, the effect can be sensed. I heard him. He said it could be sensed as a complete absence or blockage of the force, as if someone were no longer there, as if, perhaps, they had been knocked senseless. The metal face was completely opaque. 
That is a possibility, I suppose. Thank the gods at last, an admission of uncertainty. Renan pounced on it. Well then, perhaps you can understand my uneasiness. If the Emperor's henchmen were to locate us, it would be disastrous for more than just our company. The whiplash would suffer as well, and a great many precious things would fall into enemy hands. Jax, that extraordinary boy, you, and of course there is the Sith holocron Jax is guarding, and that bit of pyronium Anakin Skywalker gave him, and, Renan turned to look at the droid directly, and the bota. The droid's only reaction was a cocking of his head and a brightening of his optics. What do you know about the bota? I know that Jedi Barris Offi gave it to you to transport here to the Jedi Temple. I also know what properties the bota is supposed to have and their value to the Jedi, or to Darth Vader. I think we are both in agreement that for the Dark Lord to come into possession of such a prize would be beyond disastrous. It has the potential to render him virtually omnipotent. The droid studied him for a moment, then said, Renan, we have no idea what the boater will do to one as steeped in the force as Vader is. None. Well, it can't be good. We agree on that, at least. Renan leaned forward in his chair. Have you given no thought to what might happen if Vader should possess not only the Bota, but the Pyronium and the Sith Holocron? I have given it as much thought as it deserves. Renan bit back his frustration. This was like talking to a cryptogram generator. And has it not occurred to you that these items should be separated? Yes, some time ago, in fact. Renan feigned relief. Then you've distributed them to several different hiding places. I've done what I thought necessary. Maddening, perverse, obstinate. The list of vices that no droid should ever possess grew exponentially in length. What in the name of creation could Lorne Pavan have been thinking? So you've given the bota to Jax already? I have seen to its safety. That's all you should know, don't you think? Stung. Renan opened his mouth to protest, but I-5 continued. After all, if I tell you who has the bota, and you're captured by Darth Vader, then the dark side would alert him to the fact that you had information he wanted. Information he would cheerfully scour your skull to get. Renan felt the blood drain from his head. You're right, of course, he murmured, surrendering. There was no use in interrogating a thing that would not permit itself to be interrogated. I certainly wouldn't want to be caught with any information Vader might find useful. No, said I-5. You wouldn't. It was evening by the chrono, and everyone was home from their various tasks, when the door chime sounded. Jax felt a thrill of mingled dread and anticipation course through him. He'd been working with Kaj at improving the boy's ability to concentrate, and Jax wryly realized that the interruption had disturbed his meditations far more than it had the boy's. Kaj remained seated cross-legged, apparently a few centimeters or so above the mat upon which they meditated. Jax had dropped to the floor. Silly, really. The enemy would not chime politely and ask to be admitted, so this was not an attack. Why the reaction? He thought of Tutan, Sal, and Laranth in the same heartbeat. Sal might be back to press for an answer to his proposal. And Laranth. He stood and found Kajin's gaze on him. Stay here, Jax instructed. We don't want to advertise your presence, okay? The boy nodded and returned to his contemplations, bobbing slightly higher above the mat. Jax shook his head as he went to the living room. Kaj made it look so easy. It had never been that easy for him. Dan had answered the door by the time he reached the outer room, admitting Paul House. The Zabrak police prefect looked positively grim. The emotion behind the expression on his face was so intense 
that Jax realized it was what had pulled him from his meditations. House was wrapped in dark force threads that, though as insubstantial as smoke, were troublingly sinister and seemed to be in constant motion. They went nowhere. They simply wound themselves around the prefect in a visible analog for the tension that showed in his face, his pale gray lines bracketing his mouth. The prefect stepped through the conapt doorway and let the door glide shut behind him before he spoke. We've got a situation, he said without preamble. Jax exchanged glances with Den. A situation, he prompted. The Zabrak fixed him with a steady gaze. His eyes, usually distracted and unfocused, were as sharp as the pointy end of a vibrosword. This, Jax realized, was the real Paul House, the man who lived beneath the carefully cultivated air of shambling disorganization. One of your lot has murdered an Inquisitor. One of my lot? House tipped his horned head to one side. Come on, kid. Do I have to spell it out? A Jedi, if not officially, then a pretty powerful force sensitive. Seems he or she fried this Inquisitor with the energy siphoned from a couple of badly aligned repulsor fields. Is that in your repertoire? Oh, frip, muttered Den. Jax very nearly took a step backward, but sensing no hostility from the Zabrak, stood his ground. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Of course that's not in my repertoire. I'm not save it, Pavan. I don't have time to let you blow smoke at me, and you don't want to make me mad at you. Look, I'm not going to give you up to the Inquisitorius, if that's what you're wondering, so let's just see if... We can't work past this momentary awkwardness and get to the heart of the matter. That had, in fact, been what Jax had been wondering, if he was looking a threat in the face. Now, reaching out toward House with tendrils of force, he wasn't so sure. Jax, then shifted nervously from foot to foot, glancing up at the Jedi's face. Apparently not liking what he saw there, he swore again, this time more volubly. No, Jack said in answer to House. No, it's not in my repertoire. I don't have that kind of ability. Paul House nodded. That's sort of what I figured. The perp was described to me as a rogue force sensitive, dangerous and out of control. It was suggested to me that I do everything in my power, move every resource at my disposal, to run this rampaging adept to ground. Suggested by... Den asked. House kept his gaze on Jax as he answered Den's question. Darth Vader. Den made an incoherent sound somewhere between a groan and a growl. Jax blinked and gave House's mantle of force threads a more careful look. Yes, they made more sense now. The prefect had been touched by the emissary of the dark side. The touch still stained his personal aura and obviously disturbed him a great deal. So that's why I'm here, the prefect continued. If a Jedi or some rogue force user offed this Inquisitor. You're the best person to help me find them before they assassinate another one. Jax gestured at the room behind him. Why don't you come in and have a seat and we'll discuss it. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see the expression on the Celestin's face, dumbfounded, didn't even begin to cover it. Jax nudged Den into motion as he turned to follow the prefect into the living room. What are you doing? Den mouthed at him. Jax waved the journalist back, mouthing in return, Get I-5 and Deja, and nodding toward the workstation alcove. Den scurried away, while Jax led the prefect into the living room. Jax knew that Den had no idea what he was doing. 
Truth be told, Jax himself wasn't sure what he was doing. But he was painfully aware that the object of Paul House's search was sitting not six meters away, separated from them by a meager plasticrete wall. A wall that would prove to be no barrier at all, should Kaj panic and invoke his connection to the Force. Prefect House would learn then mighty fast where the rogue Force-sensitive was hiding, assuming that he survived the discovery. 8. How did you know I was a Jedi? Jack stood where the kinetic light from Vespolet's sculpture played across his face, obscuring his expression from the police prefect, who paced up and down the center of the living room, his dingy topcoat swirling about his legs. Who, or what, gave me away? Do you really want to know? Yes. No big proof. More like a body of evidence. A lot of little things. The way your companions and associates react to you. The way you carry yourself. The way you observe what's going on around you. The way you react to it. The way you seem to disappear from my radar sometimes when I know you're there. The way your hand hovers over your left tip when you sense danger. The speed of your reactions. House shrugged. Someone sent a bounty hunter after you. A Sith-trained bounty hunter. You came back alive. She didn't. Jack's new house was talking about Aura Singh. He had wondered if the Sith lightsaber he now carried hadn't belonged to her. The fact that he'd gotten it from an anonymous source just prior to his confrontation with Singh surely couldn't have been a coincidence. He didn't ask how House had known about the connection. He was the police prefect. It was his business to know that sort of thing. Jax just hadn't expected that he would know it. Apparently, he had underestimated Paul House. House continued. When someone like that shows up on your turf, you find out why as quickly and quietly as you can. I knew she was trailing a Jedi a young Jedi who matched your description. I called in a few favors, got a list of Jedi who still haven't been run down. Guess whose name was on there? He looked at Jax with a cocked eyebrow. Did you want to be found? Because I'm thinking you sure didn't go to a whole lot of trouble to make yourself scarce. Now that he'd laid it out, it did seem to Jax that he'd done a remarkably poor job of covering his tracks. He wondered what House had divined from how his companions reacted to him. He glanced from Den to Renan to Deja to I-5. He wasn't going to ask that just now. Instead, he asked, Vader came to you directly? House snorted. Get serious. He sent one of his goons. Oh, excuse me, one of his inquisitors to fetch me. He made sure the meeting took place on his turf and that I was suitably impressed with his security measures and clout. Jax stiffened. You were at Vader's headquarters. Images flashed through his head of tracking devices and furtive tales. Judging from the expression on Renan's and Den's faces, their thoughts had taken the same path. Deja, bless her, seemed not to have caught the sinister implications of the prefect's words. Her lips were parted, her eyes bright, as if he'd just told her that she'd been awarded a prize. I-5, correctly interpreting Jax's concern, said, He's clean. Any tracking devices would have pinged the sensor net at the entrance to the muse. House, his gaze never leaving Jax's face, said, Don't worry. I'm a professional. I went back to my own headquarters and had myself carefully and completely debugged. And yes, there were some stowaways on my person. They're gone now. And no, I don't really give an armored rat's behind what Vader thinks of me removing them. What I do care about, he added, is that a rogue force user, a truly rogue force user, 
might be a little overexcited by his ability to take out inquisitors. He might develop a taste for it. He might strike again, which would be very bad for all of us. Jax felt Kaja's presence on the other side of the door to his room, felt the chill spikes of his sudden fear. He split his attention, sending the youth calming thoughts. So, House continued, I'm sure it comes as no surprise, Pavan, that I need someone of your unique ability to help me find the assassin. House's words fell into the room like a gigantic boulder into a placid stream. Kaja's reaction hit Jax in a cold wave of terror. Apparently, Deja sensed it too, for she rose from her seat, her crimson eyes wide. Jax, she murmured, but anything else she might have said was interrupted by a loud thud from the next room and the unmistakable sound of a Sontaran song ball being abused. Paul House frowned, turning to look in the direction of the open doorway. You have more house guests? Oh, no, said Deja, looking apologetic. It's my whisper kit droid. I've forgotten to deactivate it. Again, she added, with charming self-deprecation. I do that so often. You really should remind me, Jax, not to leave it playing with its toys. I'll just go turn it off. She swept across the room to Jax's door and disappeared inside. Her voice came back to them lightly. Only Jax caught the undertone of agitation. Oh, there you are, you poor thing. Come down from there now. Everything's just fine. Did that nasty song ball scare you? They heard the soft chime of the Sonterran meditation device. Then Deja said, Good droid. Come to Deja. Both Den and Renan had turned a pale shade of blue-gray and looked about to leap out of their respective skins. I-5 was as impenetrable as a droid was supposed to be. Jax felt laughter, born of relief, bubbling up from his throat. He pushed it back down. Without doubt, Deja was the only one among them who could have walked into that room just then with the least chance of being felled by the frightened boy's power. Deja was at that moment the only one Kajin trusted. Jax almost shook his head in bemusement. A Zeltron empath accomplishing what even a Jedi knight most likely could not. He turned back to Paul House. You were saying you wanted our help finding the assassin. What do you intend to do with him if we catch him? It was not Jax's imagination that everyone in the room held his breath. After a moment of close scrutiny, the prefect said slowly, deliberately, Turning him over to Vader is out of the question. He killed an Inquisitor, so he's clearly not a Sith or a Sith sympathizer. That means his abilities could be used by the Jedi. Prefect, Jax said quietly, I don't know that there are any other Jedi on Coruscant. Or anywhere else, for that matter. House lowered his horned head and gave Jax an almost sly look out of the corners of his eyes. I have it on good authority that there are other Jedi about. Can't tell you where or who, but I'm convinced they're there. And this powerful an adept shouldn't be lost to them, I'm thinking. Den leaned forward in his window casement. So you'd, what, help smuggle him off-world? Go underground? What? I mean, Vader would expect you to turn the killer in, right? Yes, he would. Which is why when I tell him that the killer died while we were in pursuit of him, fell into the materials hopper of a fabric at the spaceport, say, he would most likely believe me. Jax blinked and met the prefect's golden eyes. He swept him again with his force sense, which he was convinced the Zabrak knew he was doing. 
and again saw the swirling ribbons of smoky darkness encircling him. They were dimmer now, less active, but they were still there. Darth Vader's residual touch, or something else? Something dark that emanated from Paul House himself? Jax knew the prefect was asking for trust, for cooperation. But he also knew the consequences if those were mistakenly given. He couldn't take that chance. Even though House seemed to have disinterred a great deal of information about their activities, at least insofar as they concerned Aura Singh, did he know these things, or was he merely guessing, hoping Jax would reveal more? You'll understand if I'm reluctant to jump into this, Jack said. You're talking about a potential Jedi, and I've only your word that you mean this person no harm. The Zabrak nodded. Yes, though I might be able to get someone else's word, someone you trust. And besides, I've shown that I mean you no harm, Jedi. I've suspected that you were more than you made yourself out to be for some time. I could have run to Vader and said, Hey, check out this bunch. They've got connections on their connections, and their leader seems to always land on his feet, no matter who's trying to stomp on his toes. I haven't done that. Maybe because we're too valuable to you, suggested Den. Up till now, anyway. Now you've got a chance to maybe look like a big hero to his dark lordliness. And maybe if we help you find this... this person, you'll just hand him over to Vader, figuring there's nothing we can do without putting our own lives in jeopardy. And if we don't help you find him, maybe you just hand over Jax instead. That thought had also occurred to Jax, and filled him with a sinking dread. To have to leave Coruscant? to run away from all he wanted to accomplish, away from the chance at finding out the truth about his father's death. Oh, I don't believe Paul House would do anything so dastardly. All eyes turned to where DJ Duare stood in the doorway of Jax's room, gleaming like a red sunset. She crossed back to the seating area, wafting so close to the prefect that her translucent gowns brushed his disreputable duster. As he noted himself, she continued, he's had reason to suspect our situation here for some time, and he's done nothing. The plan, he suggests, might even satisfy Darth Vader and make it even less likely that we'll be discovered. I feel we should consider his job offer. Dija Duare is absolutely right, House said, smiling crookedly. I have no reason to want to disband this group or sever my ties with it. You get results that my forces can't. Besides, if I were to betray the Inquisitor Killer to Darth Vader, you'd just try to rescue him. With all due respect, you put your lives in danger every day of the year. Your lives are in danger at this very moment. Things move out there in the dark he added, sweeping a broad gesture toward the city outside Den's window casement. You know that as well as I do. And some of them are looking for you. How kind of you to remind us, said I-5, speaking for the first time. The sound of his voice made Den start visibly and nearly topple from his window ledge. The Zabrak prefect laughed. I've had opportunities to help them find you. I haven't. I won't. Your choice on whether you believe that or not. Jax glanced at Deja. She could sense the emotional subtext of House's message. What did she think? She gave the slightest nod, the merest glimmer of a smile. All right, Jax said. We'll help you find your force user. But if he's as powerful as Vader says he is, then he may be impossible to find. Unless he wants to be found. The unseen listener in Jax's quarters coiled and uncoiled, still teetering on the edge of terror. Understood. The prefect turned on his heel and started for the front door, 
the job interview apparently at an end. Jax moved with him side by side to the door and saw him out into the hall. Tell me, Prefect, he said. What about my companion's reactions hinted to you that I was a Jedi? Paul House turned to look at him, a wry, almost smile on his lips. You're the youngest of them, but they all look to you for direction. Even the Grey Paladin did when she was here. A question is asked. They all watch your face as if the answer is there. And though you are also the most soft-spoken, the least verbose, a glance back through the door. You're the one who makes and speaks the decisions. I can think of no one of your age who would be accorded that respect if he or she were not a Jedi. Oh, Jack said, showing some of the eloquence for which he was not famed. I see. So do I. But relax. Most people don't notice things like that. Just avid students of sentient nature, like me. He gave a sloppy half-salute with one hand and turned to go. Whose word? What? The prefect arrested his shambling gait and turned to look at Jax over his shoulder. Whose word would you give that we'd trust? Now, that would be promising what I might not be able to deliver. Or it might be revealing an important source of information. Or it might be betraying a friend. Or all or none of the above. Have your droid patch into the net in about an hour. I'll be sending you what I've got on the murder from the Imperial security drones. Jax nodded, then watched the police prefect make his way down the corridor, looking nothing like what he was. There had been a time when Jax Pavan had regarded Paul House as a disorganized, easily befuddled Imperial functionary. Now he wasn't sure what to make of him. Nine. He's gone, Jack said as he re-entered the living room. It's all right, Kaj, you can come out. A moment later, the boy appeared, looking highly spooked. Jack smiled at him reassuringly. It looks as if we may have another ally. I'd withhold judgment on that, advised Renan. You can never be too careful. Actually, you can, I-5 said and you can miss opportunities that way. Still keeping tabs on Kaj through the Force, Jax turned his objective attention to the droid. And is this an opportunity or a risk? Aren't they two sides of the same coin? Opportunity rarely comes without risk. Oh, stop it, Five, said Den. You sound like a carnival oracle droid. Opportunity, my Aunt Freema's dewlaps. All this is is one more person. One more person with a link to his evilness who knows Jax is a Jedi. I see no particular upside to that. I think we should relocate immediately. Ah, somewhere not on this planet, I assume. I'm willing to compromise. I'll consider the same galactic sector. But where would I go? Kajin asked. He hovered at the very edge of the seating area, the light sculpture washing him with lambent hues. No one is going anywhere, said Jax. Den stared at him. House could be on his way to Vader right this minute. Den, said I-5, you're showing every sign of rampant paranoia. You know the difference between paranoia and realistic concern? Breathing. The way I see it, Den said, House has little to lose by tipping Vader to us and much to gain in the way of prestige. I don't trust him. Behind Jax. Kaj uttered a sick moan, and much to Jax's astonishment, disappeared entirely from Jax's force radar. Startled, the Jedi turned, just as the boy slid into a form chair, simultaneously coming back into sight, as it were. Had Kaj just disconnected from the force? Could he do this at will? From his attitude, he seemed unaware of what had just happened. Even so, the implications were stunning. Jax opened his mouth to say something, but Deja had launched into a disagreement with Den. 
That's because you can't sense him, Dan. Not like Jax and I can. Right, Jax? I... Jax pulled his attention away from Kajin, who continued to brood. What I sense from houses... Anomalous. He's got some dark ribbons of force around him, but they don't seem to be connected to Vader or anyone else, which is unusual. There's an underlying agitation there, though. My sense of it is that he's more disturbed by Vader than he cares to admit. Well, I'm not sensing anything anomalous, Deja said. I don't sense any duplicitous emotions from him at all. You're not getting your psychic impressions of him through the Force, Renan pointed out which leads me to trust them all the more. A moment of somewhat stunned silence followed this. Then Jack said, Before, when he was playing the bungling detective, did you realize that's what he was doing? Did you sense duplicity then? Deja stared at him in surprise. He felt suddenly contrite and nearly apologized aloud. I sensed no malice, she answered. But neither did you realize that he was concealing his true nature, said I-5. Anger flashed briefly in the Zeltron's eyes. I sensed he was hiding no hostility, she repeated. Why would you assume that anyone who meant us harm must necessarily feel hostility for us, the droid asked. Beings often hurt each other for reasons other than emotional impulse. Some of the greatest atrocities in history have been orchestrated with complete dispassion. The Emperor's annihilation of the Kamasi homeworld, for example. Or, to put it on a more personal level, Tutan Sal's betrayal of Jax's father. In the latter case, Sal certainly held no malice toward him. If you had been privy to the last meeting Lorne and I had with him, you would very likely have come to the same conclusion. We were in no danger, because Sal wasn't hostile toward us. What about you, I-5? Jax asked the droid. You're a student of humanoid body language? Do you think Paul House is enough of a threat that we should leave Coruscant? I think we may wish to relocate somewhere else in the city, perhaps keeping this place up as a front, but not so much because I distrust Paul House as because I trust Vader to be hyper-vigilant. I also think that if Paul House is our enemy, he has the potential to be a bad one, because he will most certainly have all the usual means of escape watched, if not already closed. Getting off-world cleanly is probably not a realistic option at this point. Jax again felt Kaja's emotions spike. Then he winked out again. Jax swung around to face him. What are you doing? The boy, force visible once more, froze as he was rising from the chair. Liquid light from the sculpture splashed his face. I was just... He started, but Jax cut him off. No, I mean, how did you shield yourself from the Force just now? The boy swallowed in obvious confusion. I... I didn't do anything. Twice in the last couple of minutes you have virtually disappeared from view through the Force. Are you sure you didn't make that happen? I didn't do anything, Kaj repeated, a note of sullenness creeping into his voice. Not consciously, perhaps, said I-5, regarding the young Force prodigy with obvious interest. But it could have been an involuntary part of your fight-or-flight response. What were you feeling just now? Afraid? I was feeling afraid. Nervous. I don't want to leave Coruscant. My parents said they'd try to come here to find me. If I leave... Fear. Jax looked at the droid. You're suggesting he disappears when his fear reaches panic proportions. I've never heard of any Force-sensitive who could do that. Besides, when he was confronted with the Inquisitor, he didn't just disappear. He fought. He used the Force to fight, not to hide. I-5 turned to the boy. You've been dodging the Inquisitors for some time now. Are you certain there isn't some trick you use? Something that may even seem second nature to you, that allows you to hide yourself from them? Something that's allowed you to escape them? I've escaped them by knowing where they are and using the Force as little as possible when they're around. Jax and I-5 exchanged glances. You mean you've learned to read the Tao Zin signature? Asked Jax. The damping field? In other words, you know where they are by sensing where they're not? Is that what it is? Kaj shrugged, 
apparently unwinding a little bit. He cast a shy smile at Deja, who continued to hover in the background. It feels like ripples to me, like weird little splashes, water flowing around a rock. He looked into the light sculpture and took a deep breath. You know, looking at this thing is relaxing. Maybe I could use it for meditation. He moved a step closer to Vesvalet's masterpiece and disappeared for the third time. What is it? I-5 asked, and Jax realized he was staring once again at the boy. He just disappeared, didn't he? Deja asked, her voice hushed. You can't feel the force from him while he's standing that close to the sculpture. How do you know? I lost him telepathically, too, or nearly so. He's muted. Gray. I'm gray? Kaj looked at his arms as if expecting to see himself in black and white. Jax felt a rising tide of excitement wash through him. Kaj, step away from the light sculpture. Huh? He waved the boy back with one hand. Kaj looked puzzled, but did as asked. He reappeared in the force as soon as he had cleared the dance of light by about half a meter. Deja, Jax murmured. She nodded solemnly. He's back, vividly. Jax motioned at Kaj. Now walk around behind it. Kaj obeyed, moving behind the light sculpture at a distance of about a meter. His force threads broke like so many strands of hair-thin synth silk. With his eyes, Jax could see him vaguely through the kinetic display, but he couldn't see him at all with the force. Walk away from the sculpture, he told Kaj. Move toward the wall. The boy did, and remained hidden from the force. Incredible, murmured Deja. I had no idea Vess's light sculptures possessed this property. Brow furrowed. She moved slowly around the display, stopping only when she stood next to Kaj, opposite Jax. Then she peered at the Jedi through the moving pattern of lights. I can't sense you, she murmured, then glanced from Den to Renan. Any of you? The idea seemed to disturb her. Wrapping her arms about herself, she left the room without another word. What was that about? Dan asked. Perhaps, said Renan, one of us should inquire. She seemed unhappy. I'll go, he added before anyone else could respond, then moved after Deja with an alacrity that was no less surprising than the gesture itself. To his further amazement, Jax could swear that Den had also made a move in Deja's direction. He didn't have time to give headspace to the Zeltron woman's peculiar reaction to their discovery, however. The overall implications of it, as far as their current predicament was concerned, were too important. Jax, I-5, and Kaj all gathered around the undulating display of colorful light. A moment later, Den joined them and they all stood looking at the thing like a flock of art gallery patrons gawking at the newest exhibit. Any theories, I-5? Jax asked the droid. Any idea how or why the light sculptures might cause this sort of damping effect? The display itself uses a combination of electro and bioluminescence, so I suppose there is a possibility that it could somehow warp the kinetic energies of biological entities. But I think it more likely that it's the power source. The light sculpture creates a cohesion field capable of bending light to the desired shape by using a lightsaber crystal. Perhaps it bends more than light. Jax stared at the droid. You're saying the force might not be blocked, but instead shunted somewhere else? Possibly, but not necessarily. I would suggest, given the challenges inherent in training your Padawan, that you may wish to conduct some simple experiments. There are still at least half a dozen of these sculptures in Vesvolet's studio. It would be interesting to know if they all create the same effect, and if they damp telekinetic and other psionic forces, or, as you suspect, shunt them off somewhere else. What I'm wondering, said Jax, is what would happen if a force user was surrounded by them? Would they make an effective wall? A redistribution enclosure, suggested I-5. Something like an EM cage? Uh, what? Den wanted to know. 
An electromagnetic cage is an enclosure lined with conducting metal designed to block various frequencies of radiation, I-5 explained. It's extremely versatile and has been used for millennia. What Jax is postulating is essentially the same concept applied to the force. Hard to believe that someone hasn't stumbled across such a basic concept already, Jax said. Not really. For centuries, the only ones really interested in the force were the Jedi. And their R&D was much more esoteric and theoretical than practical. Their emphasis was always on ways to augment the force, rather than restrict it. The droid looked closely at the light structure. We'll no doubt have to tweak the frequency for optimal results. Jax glanced toward the closed door to Deja's quarters. Not without her permission. She loves those sculptures. They're all she's got left of Ves Follette. Naturally, we would get her permission, I-5 conceded. But I can't imagine she would withhold it. She has, after all, been an outspoken proponent of you pursuing a serious training regimen with Kajin. You really think a shield of these things would work? The boy asked, staring up into the play of light. There's only one way to find out, Jack said, and turned toward Deja's quarters. I-5 put a pewter-shaded hand on his shoulder. I think perhaps you should wait until Renan has had a chance to ascertain what's bothering her. Jax felt a twinge of remorse. He'd been so wrapped up in their discovery that he hadn't given thought to Deja's apparent discomfort with it. He should have gone after her, he supposed. But this, he gave the light sculpture another appraising glance. This could be the perfect solution to his current quandary. He wondered how the Elliman was faring in his attempt to comfort the Zeltron. He'd thought Renan completely immune to Deja's gentle emotional tugging and prodding. Apparently he'd been wrong. Deja, are you unwell? Renan stood on the threshold of the Zeltron's room and peered in at her. She had gone immediately to sit in a false window seat, staring at a projected image of her late lover's equally deceased homeworld, Kamas. The Empire had seen fit to all but extinguish the elegant and gentle Kamasi, Renan recalled. Only a handful of those living on the planet, and emigrants to other worlds, had survived the scourge. Hiding, she said softly. Vess was hiding from me, Renan. He had surrounded himself with objects behind which he could hide from me emotionally, withhold himself from me, whenever he wished. Perhaps he didn't realize that, Renan said. He felt excruciatingly uncomfortable. The only species that found speaking about emotions more anathema than Elliman were given. She shook her head. No, he knew it. He must have known it to have used it so carefully that I never suspected. If it were a random effect, he would have disappeared emotionally at random moments, not merely when he wanted to. Not merely how he wanted to. She seemed to struggle for a moment with the idea, then added, I thought I was party to his private thoughts and feelings the direct reflection of his soul. But he was only allowing me to catch a muted echo. Oh, surely he wouldn't be so cruel. He wasn't being cruel. She looked up at him with wide, tear-filled eyes. He was just being private, independent. It's too much to expect a non-Zeltron to be as, as public as we are. He just wanted to keep some of himself for himself. And so he died, surrounded by his barrier of light. It has always bothered me that I didn't feel even a touch of fear or pain from him that day. And now I understand why. Even the day his world died. She put a hand up to her mouth. I doubt you would have wanted to feel that, my dear said Renan, trying to go for an avuncular impression. Your kind are not known for their tolerance of negative emotions. No, and right now I'm feeling... betrayed. I know I shouldn't, 
I know it was just his way of retaining a sense of privacy, but consider your friend's kindness in sparing you the full brunt of his grief, Renan suggested. Perhaps that will assuage your feelings of betrayal. She smiled wryly and wiped her nose on the sleeve of her garment, a gesture that Renan found strangely charming, given his usual distaste for such things. Count my blessings, Renan, she murmured. An odd sentiment coming from you. Yes, it was, rather. He caught himself, realizing what was happening. In her agitated state, Dija Duare was undoubtedly pumping more pheromones into the atmosphere than she usually did, so much so that some of them were creeping past his natural immunity. He shook himself. He must not be distracted from his goal. My dear, he said, retaining the endearment because he thought it useful. Can you be thinking that Jax Pavan also might use this technology to hide from you, as you put it? She blinked up at him, eyes sparkling with tears. It, it, now that you mention it, yes, he certainly could. He has the force to hide behind, of course. Her mouth turned up at the corners, and her eyes shed bereavement as if it were a transient film, to be flicked away with a wink. But that's entirely different. The force, even used to filter or block, has such interesting textures. In some ways, it's more satisfying to the touch than the emotions it conceals. Renan was intrigued and annoyed simultaneously. This hedonistic telempath clearly had a higher midichlorian count than he did. If she did not possess a capacity for force manipulation herself, she clearly could sense it. Textures, he repeated. How interesting. Oh, more than interesting. She drew her knees up under her chin and hugged them. The gesture was at once childlike and seductive, or would have been if the Elemen were capable of being seduced. Even when Jax pulls the force across himself like a curtain, she continued, it's a curtain of amazing depth and nuance. Like a warm bath, like sun-heated sand beneath your feet, like morning grass at the first touch of the sun, or... She looked up, caught the look on Renan's face, and laughed. I don't do it justice, and still you think me over-imaginative and over-emotional. No, my dear, of course not. He did think those things, but they were potentially useful things, so he tried not to dispense with them. I was merely wondering how you would perceive the effects of the bota extract if Jax were to use it. The what? Renan gazed into the Zeltron's eyes. Ploy or honest puzzlement? He couldn't tell which. The bota, the plant extract, once deemed a panacea. Yes, I know what bota is, or was. It's pretty much just a weed in its current form, isn't it? It mutated or something years ago. It did. But I was speaking of its ability to enhance the use of the force. I thought perhaps you'd know about that, being, as you are, so close to Jax. She shook her head, her burgundy brows drawn together above her eyes. Enhance the force? What are you talking about? Jax has never mentioned anything to me about such a thing. Ah, that's odd. According to the droid, a Jedi named Barris Offy serendipitously discovered that an injection of bota extract amplified or expanded a Jedi's force perception and ability exponentially. While they were on Drongar together, she gave a vial of the extract to I-5YQ to bring to the Jedi Temple. By the time he arrived, of course, Order 66 had been implemented. And so, so I-5 has it? And Jax knows this? I assume one of them has it. Though I could be wrong, the droid might have given it to someone else or hidden it somewhere. Renan shrugged as if the location of the Bota were of no interest to him at all. I've no idea. But why hasn't Jax used it? If it amplifies the force, as you say, mightn't that make him powerful enough? She paused, took a deep breath, then continued with a lowered voice. 
to destroy the emperor? Renan was no thespian, but he put every gram of acting ability he had behind his next words. Indeed, it might. Perhaps the droid isn't the best candidate for an assassin after all. So why hasn't Jax taken the bota? Gazing down into the Zeltron woman's avid face, Haninum Tikrinan had an epiphany. If something was missing, the more people you had looking for it, the better. He frowned and tapped his thin lips with one flat fingertip. Perhaps because he doesn't know where it is. I begin to suspect that the droid has not yet given it to him, that perhaps he has hidden it instead. Why would he do that? Renan shrugged. Who knows? Were he a normal droid, the answer would have to be because someone instructed him to do it. But I-5 is not a normal droid, so that opens up a score of possibilities. Perhaps he wants to be the hero instead of Jax. Perhaps he wishes to exact vengeance on the Emperor and Darth Vader himself. Deja looked thoughtful. No, that's not like him. More likely, he's trying to protect Jax. Feign innocence, Renan instructed himself. Project guilelessness. It, along with his natural immunity to the Zeltron's wiles, seemed to be working. Protect him from what? From making himself a tool of vengeance. To do that would be to give in to the dark side, wouldn't it? Or maybe he's afraid of side effects. Are there side effects? She glanced up at him askance. I don't know, he said, irritated by the digression. I do know, or understand from the little I've learned, that the extract would make the Jedi who takes it, well, very nearly godlike in power and abilities. But for how long, she murmured, her eyes going to the static view of the dead world projected into the niche above her window seat. And at what cost? Cost, repeated Renan. She gave him a gamine look from beneath her long, blood-red lashes. Nothing is without cost, Renan. Nothing. Her eyes moved back to the image of the world that no longer was. It's all a matter of trade-offs, of knowing what something is worth. Different things are of varying worth to different people he observed neutrally. Yes, Deja murmured. They are. She reached over and tapped a small touchpad next to the image niche. The view of the once verdant surface of Kamas disappeared, to be replaced by a panorama of a jungle scape in which the dominant color was red. Renan assumed it was an image of Deja's homeworld, Zeltros. Sitting before the landscape, she all but disappeared into it. She turned her gaze back to Rena. Do you think I-5 is wrong to keep Jax from the bota, if that's what he's about? Wrong. Rena splayed a thin, spidery hand over his heart. I can't judge the wrong or right of the situation, my dear. I only know that it exists as a possibility. And as for what the droid is about, look at the evidence. Jax wants nothing more than to destroy the Emperor and Darth Vader, and to restore not only the Jedi, but the fortunes of the Republic. The Bota could give him the means to do it, but he hasn't used it, or even suggested that he use it. The only logical reason I can think of for that is that the droid has hidden it from him. If the droid were a biological life form, Jax could influence his thinking, but he isn't, and he follows orders, poorly or not at all. Therefore, he is impervious even to Jax. Yet I detect no strain between Jax and I-5, Deja observed. At least Jax doesn't seem to have any negative feelings for the droid. Perhaps because our mechanical friend has done a good job of convincing him that withholding the bota is for the best. I-5 can be quite persuasive when the need arises. After all, he is, or was, a protocol unit. Deja shrugged. Perhaps he's right. Perhaps it is for the best. Renan's smile was so brittle, he feared it might crack his lips. I'm sure of it, Deja, he said. After all, who knows the Jedi better than I-5? 
Di Jadware merely smiled. My, look at the time, Renan said, glancing at his chrono. He left quickly, on the pretext that he was expecting a data dump from one of the Imperial intel links he was monitoring, and went away unsure of what, if anything, he had accomplished. Clearly, Di Jadware had known nothing of the Bota until he had mentioned it. Had that mention fueled a further sense of betrayal? Had it intrigued her? Amused her? Frightened her? He gave up his maundering. Who knew what a creature like that was likely to do? She was, as Pavan was wont to note, an atypical Zeltron. In some ways, that made her as hard to read and as frustrating as Pavan's metal guardian. He exhaled gustily, then winced. His nose tusks were vibrating so much lately from sighing that the anchoring flesh was getting sore. The prefect removed our tracking devices within minutes of returning to his headquarters. Darth Vader's gloved hand moved in a dismissive gesture. That was to be expected. He's a traitor, then. He's chosen his side. Has he? The Dark Lord turned, and Probus Tesla saw his distorted reflection in the curved black surfaces of the Dark Lord's optic panels. His image was warped, but the marks of his brush with death were still clearly visible on his face, notwithstanding the hours spent in a Bacta tank. No matter. The scars served their purpose. They reminded him that hubris was a failing he could not afford and that false assumptions based on hubris could be deadly. He would not forget that hard-learned lesson. Or, Vader continued, is he just being a prudent and cautious officer of the prefecture? Do you imagine that those we seek would not check for tracking devices? If they found them, Paul House would become useless to us. They'd never trust him. Then we still don't know where he stands. No. How will we know? If he continues to evade our attempts to track him, we'll know he's Taizan Yemon's man. But if one day he is less than vigilant about such things... Tesla smiled, the gesture hurt, tugging at the new flesh on his barely healed face. The pain, like the scars, was also good. It was a reminder of his personal goal. With or without the help of Prefect Paul House, he would track down the Force prodigy who had done this to him, be he Jedi or not, and either bring him as a prize to his master, or destroy him utterly. 10. I don't get it, Den said. Why are you asking me this? Obviously, Renan replied, his face, his posture, his entire person saying that he thought the question idiotic because I thought that perhaps you knew. Den gestured at the virtual send icon on the hollow display and watched his message to I.R. Marath soar away on wings of, well, whatever such messages soared away on. I don't know, he said. I suppose I assumed that Five had it or had done whatever he thought appropriate with it. Maybe he gave it to Jax. Doubtful. Why doubtful? Renan shrugged. Jax has said nothing about it, and he obviously hasn't used it. Well, yeah, I kind of think we'd know if he had, considering what it's supposed to do. But he wouldn't just use it without warning us. What makes you say that? Den gave the element a withering glance. I know Jax Pavan. He got up from his workstation. I just remembered it's my turn to do the shopping. Gotta run. I'll see you later. You must realize what could happen if that substance should fall into the wrong hands. The words turned Dan around in the doorway of the workroom. Yeah, Renan, I'm not a total milking moron, I do get it. But frankly, there's not a whole lot I can do about it, other than trying to talk my good friend the droid out of doing something abysmally dangerous. So you're not even curious? Dan shook his head. Nope, not even. An odd state of mind for a... Journalist, don't you think? Heat flashed up the back of Den's neck and around the rims of his ears. Now, that was just plain low. 
I only meant, you only meant that you don't think I'm much of a journalist. Well, maybe I'm not. And maybe I don't want to be anymore. Oh, now that was a mature comeback. Renan's eyes narrowed. You have it, don't you? He murmured. You've got the bota. And you've got a loose sanity chip, big guy. There's no way that I-5 would trust me with that stuff. Nonsense. I can think of no one else he'd trust more. Dan shook his head. Well, then you've been into the dream spice, Renan, because I don't have it. And I don't much care who does. The Elloman didn't try to stop him again. Den managed to get out of the Conapt and make his way down several levels to a little cafe on the fringes of the Plautical that he frequented. There, he ordered himself a hot calf and a steamed bun stuffed with vegetables and meat, the provenance of which it was wisest not to inquire about, and sat at a metal table under an arbor covered with plants that were no more real than the meat in the bun. He had finished his meal and was working on his third cup of calf, when he felt watched. He looked up nervously, his eyes drawn to a hooded figure at a booth across the way. The cowled head was turned partially away from him, and he was beset with the sudden fear that he was looking at an inquisitor. The noise of the market seemed to suddenly grow in volume, and his face felt flushed and hot. That's ridiculous. Why should I be afraid of the inquisitorious? I'm not a Jedi. Maybe not, said a snarky voice from the back of his head. But you know where one lives. What should he do? Get up and leave? Order another cup of calf? The figure turned, presenting a comely profile, and Den slumped in relief. Then again, he could just invite her to join him. I-5 had suggested he make nice with Dija Duare. Why not start now? She turned away from the booth, and he waved. Seeing Den sitting in front of the cafe, Deja seemed to hesitate. Then, at his beckoning gesture, she came to take the seat opposite him. Can I buy you a drink? he suggested, feeling utterly foolish. All right, she said graciously. A calf? He got up to place the order, returning to the table with a steaming beverage and a possible, though utterly lame, way of starting the conversation. Hey, what do you think of our new boy, Wonder? He set the cup of calf in front of Deja, slid back onto his chair, and opened his mouth. Deja preempted him. I'm worried about Jax, she said. Why is that? Deja folded her hands around the thermocup, making it appear as if the steam rose from her fingertips, and looked at him earnestly. I'm terrified that I-5 is going to convince Jax to opt into Tudin Sal's ridiculous scheme. Do you have any idea of what that could mean? Didn't I already have this conversation? Den asked himself. Aloud, he said, Well, it could put both I-5 and Jax in harm's way. And us, by extension. Deja took a sip of her drink and glanced up at Den through her lashes which he could swear were getting longer by the minute. Yes, by extension. But I was thinking more of Jax himself, the thing he holds most dear. She leaned forward over the table and lowered her voice nearly to a whisper. The continuation of his kind. You mean that... Den glanced around, then made a surreptitious gesture with one hand, imitating someone wielding a lightsaber. She nodded. What makes you think he'll go for the scheme? I mean, there's every reason not to do it, don't you think? Of course. Apart from the danger to himself, there's the risk to the whiplash, the others of his kind, and the boy. The fact that failure would even more deeply enslave us all. And failure, she added, is the most likely result. Den blanched. I-5 seems to think it would work. I-5 is thinking like a biological life form, not a droid. It's wishful thinking. The odds against him succeeding are astronomical. If there were only some way to make certain of his success and of Jax's survival. She shook her head. I'm sure Five has a plan, Den said weakly. She frowned. 
Renan said the same thing. He talked about something called, um, Bota, is that right? Yes, Bota. He said it would make Jacks invincible. Startled, Den snorkeled hot calf up his nose and went into a fit of sneezing and choking. Wind spirits bless you, Deja murmured, after Zeltron custom, bowing her head almost into her cup. Thanks, Den said when he could talk again. He wiped his nose on his sleeve. Renan said that? He told you about the bota? I wasn't sure he knew. Yes, poor thing. He's worried, too. He said the bota is the only real chance that Jax has to survive if I-5 and Sal go through with this ridiculous plan. If he's able to take it at the appropriate time, he'll be able to blow our enemy away. Den tried not to look stupefied. Really? He said that? She nodded again. So I asked him if he was sure the boater was where Jax could get to it easily, and he said he didn't know. He had to trust that I-5 had done something with it to keep it safe. Den shrugged. Well, sure. I trust I-5, don't you? She fixed him with a look that all but curled the rims of his ears. Den exhaled explosively, feeling as if she'd gut-punched him. Point taken. So you think I-5's not firing on all thrusters? A delusional droid. Was that even possible? He remembered how Deja's partner had been murdered and felt more blood drain out of his head. I think that as much as I-5 loves Jax Pavan, she said. He loves his father's memory more. Remember, Dan, I-5YQ doesn't have the same sense of time that we have. He doesn't forget anything no matter how unpleasant the memory is or how long ago it was made. Organic sentience can count on the passage of the days, the months, and the years to create a comforting buffer zone that softens the reality for us, makes it bearable. Time heals all wounds, except those of droids. Ordinarily, this wouldn't be a problem since a droid has no emotional ties to the past. But once again, i five sentience makes him unique. Lorne Pavan's betrayal is as fresh to him today as it was twenty-odd years ago. Or as fresh, anyway, as it was the moment he recovered that particular memory and realized what it meant. There were tears sparkling in the Zeltron's eyes as she finished. Den realized his own eyes had grown moist, and his breath had all but stopped in his throat. It had never occurred to him that there had to have been a singular moment in which that particular memory, as Deja put it, had resurfaced for his friend, never to be put aside again. Nor had it occurred to him that the one way in which I-5 was all droid was in his capacity to relive his past in vivid, perfect detail. Combined with his ability to imagine and theorize like an organic, well, he couldn't even begin to imagine how much pain I-5 must be in. Den drew in a long breath. I-5 may not have seen Lorne Pavan's death in real time, but Den was willing to bet he'd imagined it time and time again. And because he was a droid, he could not escape it, even in sleep, since droids didn't sleep. The only other respite was temporary deactivation, which was not a real respite at all, since no subjective time was lost. I-5 could not forget his loss or gain perspective on it through the balm of years. Ever which left only one course of action open to him. You think I-5 wants to avenge Lorne Pavan? If someone destroyed I-5 or killed Jax, wouldn't you contemplate revenge? Would he? He liked to think that he'd only contemplate justice. But who knew? He considered the idea now and nodded. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I might at that. Okay, so we may have a vengeful droid on our hands. What can we do? Deja shrugged. I don't know that we can do anything before the fact. Though I suppose we can try. You bet we can. Impulsively, the Celestin reached across the table and put his hand over the Zeltrons. If the two of us, along with Renan, keep up a united front, and if we all vote down this mad idea, Jax has to listen, doesn't he? Especially if you... 
you know, help out a little with that seductive sweat of yours? She cocked her head to one side and smiled in bemusement. You want me to influence Jax? In this case, yeah. And I'm perfectly willing to admit it's a slimy, hypocritical thing to say, but I'm willing to say it. Do your best. If it'll keep Jackson I-5 out of deep ranto poodoo, I'm all for it. Deja's eyes twinkled at him, and she laughed, the sound trilling lightly in his ears before cascading down into a sultry purr. You're an odd one, Dendur, she told him. Then her tone became serious again. I suppose there's a chance we could fail, even united. But there's always the Bota. He nodded. Truth to tell, he didn't like even thinking about Bota. The very word conjured memories of Drongar, and his time served on that plaguey world in vivid detail. The recollections might not be as realistic as I-5s, but they were more than enough for him. Renan thinks you have it. Deja said bluntly. What? Was she eavesdropping on private conversations now? He didn't ask her that. Instead, he fell back on his usual refrain. He said that? She tilted her head. A nod. A semi-nod. A maybe. Den wasn't sure. The Zeltron was humanoid enough to share a great deal of body language with most hominid species, but there was always a chance of misreading something. Well, Renan is wrong, he replied. I don't have it, and I don't know who does. For all I know, Five still has it. Deja gave him another ear-curling look. Our would-be assassin? That hardly seems wise. Look, if that boto represents what you think it represents, the survival of the... He made the lightsaber gesture again. Then I-5 will hide it where it will come to no harm and do the most good. If he hasn't done so already... Our job is to try to talk him out of plan A, so he doesn't need a plan B. Agreed? He put out his hand as if to seal a business deal. She regarded the hand solemnly for a moment, then placed her own in it, sealing the bargain. Agreed. They parted, then, Den shaking his head at the twisted situation. I-5 had been the one to suggest he forge an alliance with Deja Duare, and now they had forged one, against him. Plenty of nuance to savor there, if you're into irony, he thought. 11. There was a certain amount of guilt in Jax's concern for Deja after the discovery of the light sculpture's damping properties. He'd intended to talk to her directly after Renan had, but he'd been experimenting with the sculpture and hadn't noticed her leaving the Connaught. It wasn't until he had satisfied himself in a small way that further experiments were warranted that he left Kaj meditating in his quarters and went looking for the Zeltron, only to learn that she had gone out. Did she still seem upset when she left? He asked Renan. Upset? The Elliman shrugged his bony shoulders. I can't honestly say. You know how Zeltrons are. They tend to be mercurial. What was bothering her? Jax felt odd discussing the issue with someone other than Deja herself. But Renan had gone in to check on her. Renan considered that for a moment, then said, Well, as near as I can tell, she felt renewed bereavement because she supposed that her late partner was holding out on her. Emotionally speaking, that is hiding behind his creations. Precisely. It made her realize, I think, that her understanding of her relationship with Vess Volette was fundamentally flawed. She felt left out. I hate to say it, but that may make her more inclined to let I-5 and me tinker with the mechanics of the remaining light sculptures. Unless she's now fearing that you're going to hide behind them, too. Jax smiled wryly. I hide behind the Force. Or at least I'm pretty sure that's the way she sees it. Well, I'm going to trust that she'll realize it's for the greater good. Renan merely tilted his head and shrugged. Jax had turned and started for his room, when every hair on his body stood on end. Something was happening within the confines of his room, something so anomalous he couldn't grasp it. 
He had heard a blaster overload once, had heard the sound of it grow from a staticky buzz that made his teeth itch to a piercing whine that threatened to remove the top of his head. This was like that, but it was in his brain, in his bones, in his blood. It was a buildup not of sound, but of the force. Jax left for the door to his room and flung himself inside. Kajin Savaros lay in the middle of the floor in a fetal position, hands to his head, eyes squeezed tightly shut, rocking back and forth while the force built up within him like water behind a dam. In all his years of training with Master Peel, in all the time he had been on his own, Jax had never encountered anything like this. He had no idea what to expect, no idea what to do. On the opposite side of the room, the items atop his storage bench began to vibrate. Even as he watched, a hairbrush, a chrono, and a book of Kamasi poetry jigged their way to the edge and fell. Jax was in motion again before they hit the floor, pushing the force ahead of him as he dived for the writhing teenager. He wrapped Kaj in soft folds of the force, projected soothing, velvet calm. Then he grasped the boy's shoulders, his grip firm but gentle. He felt a backlash almost immediately, a kick like a repulsor field. He pushed back. A bottle of Dipil cream abruptly cracked, its viscous contents oozing free. Kaj, Jack said, then more sharply, Kaj, what's wrong? The boy let out a wail that penetrated all the way to Jack's soul. Alone, alone. Grasping at straws, Jack said, you're not alone, Kaj. You have me now. You have Deja and the others. You have the force. Force is doing this to me. The words came out in painful bursts, the anguish behind them breaking on Jax's mind like storm-driven wave and wind. And Deja, Deja went away. She doesn't like me. Is that what this was about? Deja? Had she been feeding the boy so much emotional stimulus through her pheromones that her absence brought this on? Deja likes you a lot, Kaj, and she'll be back soon. There was the tiniest let-up in the mounting tension, the screaming of Jax's senses muting to a mere roar. Then the boy shook his head, his fisted hands pulling at his hair. Not soon enough. Not soon enough. His eyes flew open, and he reached up to grasp the collar of Jax's tunic. Make it stop, please. Make it stop. It's burning me. What's burning you? The anger. Who are you angry with? Jax asked desperately. What's made you angry? They sent me away. Sent me here. He shook his head. I didn't want to come. If I'd stayed, maybe this wouldn't have happened to me. You're angry with your parents for sending you away? No, not them. Him. Who? Tell me. The emperor. He took everything. The farm, my life, my parents, my world, everything, everything. Jax felt it then, the huge gaping hole of loss and loneliness that lay beneath the anger. He had lost his parents too, but not like this, where he had grown up in the embrace of the Jedi. Kajin had simply been thrust out on his own, alone, to be overwhelmed by a power he didn't understand. The Jedi put his arms around the boy and held him tightly, falling into his rocking rhythm as if they were in a boat on water. Not alone, Jax told him. You're not alone. And if you really want to ruin the Emperor's day, don't let the anger take you. Don't let it win. But I can't hold it in. Then let it go, Kaj. Don't give in to it. Make it give in to you. The boy gritted his teeth and drummed his heels on the floor. I don't know how. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Say it, Kaj. There is no emotion. There is peace. Peace, Kaj whispered. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. Jax saw the boy's lips move in time to his. There is no passion. There is serenity, Kaj whispered, then repeated, there is serenity. There is no death. There is the force. They finished the credo in unison. Kaj's tightly wound body finally relaxing a bit in Jax's arms. 
the white-hot press of rage cooling. Tears slid from the boy's eyes and dripped to the meditation mat. A moment later, he was sobbing, and the threads of anger at last loosened and released him. Jax felt a trickle of perspiration race down his back beneath his tunic and realized he had broken out in a cold sweat. He heard a muffled noise and looked up to see Renan standing in the doorway, a well-pulped damrai fruit in one hand and a sodden spot in the front of his waistcoat. Will he be doing that often? he asked. If so, I suggest we store the fruit in an enclosed space. Jax smiled humorously. If Kaj did that often, the fruit would be the least of their worries. I thought I'd find you here. Two steps from the cafe, Den looked up to find I-5, regarding him placidly. And you were looking for me, why? Den asked. I was a bit concerned about your sudden disappearance earlier. It seemed as though you and Renan had a disagreement about something, I-5 said. Don't tell me you were eavesdropping, too. The droid's photoreceptors brightened. Someone was eavesdropping on your conversation with Renan? Den shrugged. I'm not sure, to be honest. But Deja seemed to know what we'd been talking about, and she would neither confirm nor deny. Ah. The unspoken question Den figured was, what would she neither confirm nor deny? I-5 started walking toward the amorphous center of the sprawling marketplace, and Den fell into step. Where are we going? he asked. To send a message to a friend. In other words, a whiplash operative. Yeah? Which one? Someone who knows a great deal about the UML. The UML, or Underground Maglev, was a route of egress the Whiplash had used for some time to ferry at-risk individuals to facilities within several of the nearby spaceports where they could be smuggled off-world. Its chief asset, oddly enough, was that it was public enough to be private. You simply melted into the crowds, and if you knew the lay of the tunnels that made up a large part of it, you could disappear and reappear somewhere else in the system in such a way that even surveillance could be defeated. The secret was a series of secondary tunnels and access tubes that had lain in long disuse and whose very existence had been erased from the engineering records of the world city. A late, high-level whiplash operative had made certain of that erasure and paid for it with his life. Since the Imperial Security Bureau thought he had been after something else altogether, as had been his intention, they simply assumed they had stopped the assassin and saboteur before he could perform whatever dastardly act he had been contemplating, and used his demise as a PR coup. Pity, Emperor Palpatine. These black-hearted so-and-sos just kept coming after him like madmen. Would they never learn? Travel plans for our Togruten client? Den asked. Yes. Auto is lovely this time of year. Den glanced sideways at the droid. Some part of Orto is lovely at any time of year. I-5 gave an irritated click. Don't be dense. I'm not. It's just that that sort of inaccuracy sounds really strange coming from you. Why Orto? The music. Our friend feels that the fact of the Ortolan's seemingly universal talent for producing highly effective music would be of great benefit for the young lady in question. Den thought of Kajin Savaros and felt a little bird of guilt with tiny, sharp talons roost in his conscience. He said, Look, there's something I need to ask you about. Tutan Sal. The droid looked down at the Celestan. I know how you feel about this enterprise, but think about the payoff if I were to succeed. Fine if you'll think about the payoff if you don't, and think about why you want to do it. I should think that was perfectly clear. It's not. Not considering the risks. Why do you think I want to do it? Vengeance? That stopped the droid in his tracks, Den was pleased to note. His optics glowed bright with surprise. No. That was it. 
just no. The droid turned on his heel and continued walking. Den trotted to catch up. That sounded an awful lot like denial. It was the truth. Are you sure? I-5 kept walking. Den had to stretch his legs to keep up. Whatever else you may think me capable of, the droid said, I am not given to lying. Who put that idea into your head? What? Now I'm not capable of acquiring ideas to put in my own head. I-5 mimicked the sound of a supercilious sniff. Okay. It was Deja. Via Rinon, or so I gather, Den said. I-5 slowed his pace. That's interesting. So they think I'm plotting vengeance on... this person? Because he murdered my partner? My friend? That's the long and short of it, yeah. And it hasn't occurred to them that while the work we're engaged in now is annoying and costly to the person in question, this new plan will cut right to the heart of the situation and remove him completely. It's occurred to them. But I guess the question is, why do you, in particular, have to do this? I stand the greatest chance of success simply because of who and what I am. Really? I'm thinking, they're thinking, that maybe Jax has the best chance of success because of who and what he is, and because of that extra little something he has, which has the potential of becoming a much bigger something extra, thanks to you. The droid stopped to stare. There was no other word for it. What are you talking about? That vegetable juice cocktail of yours. What have they said about it? Not so much said as asked. Den glanced about, then took a step closer to the droid. They were interested in where it's gone, and seem to have come to the conclusion that you've given it to me. Did they say why they were interested in it? I think it basically came down to a fear that when the sky fell, Jax wouldn't have it at his disposal. They think I would prevent him from taking it. Why? The thought that popped into Den's head, unbidden, filled him with cold horror. For the same reason you've taken on the mantle of martyrdom so readily. Because you're afraid of what Jax might do if he gets the vengeance bug and the bota at the same time. You're afraid he might take it and get sucked into the darkness. This way he might be thinking about vengeance, but you'll be the one acting on it. There was a long, tense pause, during which the sounds, colors, and smells of the bazaar seemed to come to Den through thick wads of padding. In all the universe, he could see only this droid, this gleaming metal being, this sentient who was willing to sacrifice himself in a last lethal act of protection. I-5 put a hand on Den's shoulder and yanked him out of the main thoroughfare into a dark, grimy corner behind a kiosk that smelled of machine lubricant and dust. Cock! Den squeaked. What in chaos are you? A metal hand clamped over his mouth. Inquisitors, the droid hissed. He released Den's mouth and allowed him to turn within the confines of their bolt hole. The skin at the nape of Den's neck tightened and his dewlaps quivered. There were inquisitors, all right. Three of them, moving together in well-rehearsed choreography. Three of them. I've never seen them travel together like that, I-5 murmured. That makes me feel so much better, Den said. As they watched, the Inquisitors paused to speak to the weapons dealer across the alley. The booth appeared to be selling domestic water vaporators and distilleries, but everyone who frequented the area knew that that was only a sideline. The Inquisitors were settling in for a thorough interrogation of the visibly terrified Celestin proprietor, when one of them suddenly lifted his cowled head and turned to peer down the street. Den felt a wave of chill pass over him. He thanked every Celestin deity he could think of that he wasn't Force-sensitive. The itchy Inquisitor then turned and said something to his cohorts, and suddenly all three of them were agitated. They moved off swiftly, almost seeming to float above the pocked duracrete of the bazaar, and disappeared into a lift tube at the nearest corner. 
Den shivered. Eerie. I-5 started in the direction of the Celestin's kiosk, but Den stopped him. If they tweaked that guy's warmware, having a droid start asking questions might trip some alarms. I'll go. I-5 signified his assent, and Den dived into the crowd, maneuvered through the stream of taller beings, and approached the weapons booth, shuffling a little and wringing his hands. I saw the Inquisitors, Liquana, he said to the proprietor, using a Celestin term that roughly translated into basic as cave brother. The proprietor still seemed a bit dazed. Did they tell you who did it? Den asked. Did they catch him? Did what? Oh, the murderer, you mean. No, they only asked me if I'd seen someone. His brow furrowed as if he couldn't recall who. Possibly they had wiped that memory. Really? They have a description? I... I suppose they must have. A human boy, I think, they said. He shook his head and shrugged. Thousands like that in this marketplace. Yeah, at least. Den turned and headed off down the thoroughfare. When he was out of sight of the Celestin's kiosk, he turned his head slightly and found I-5 pacing him about a meter away. Nothing, he told the droid. If they asked him about anything besides seeing a human boy, he doesn't remember. Let's go down a level, I-5 said. He led Den to a lift about two blocks distant. With luck, a safe distance from the inquisitorial trio. On the level below, they wandered a bit, before entering a Stygian side alley and making their way into the kitchen of the Emperor's Board, a charity whose impeccable handling of its community service work kept it out of the Imperial eye. The ISB hardly cared who fed the rats as long as they filed the appropriate documentation, which, apparently, Taizan Yemun did. I-5 took the lead, presenting himself to the Gungan cook. I have a price bid for your proprietor on a job he requires performed, he said, his voice free of inflection like a standard droid. From? the Gungan asked, eyeing Den. A certain purveyor of lighting supplies. He tells me your proprietor has a dim corridor he wishes to make passable. Oh, yes. The Gungan nodded zealously enough to flap his ears and cause his eye stalks to bob up and down. Yes, me's a boss is in much need of such. Passage long and very dark. You's a got to bid? I-5 produced a data crystal seemingly from nowhere and handed it to the Gungan. When you said do the work? Two days at 0700 hours, I-5 said, then uttered three clicks each one pitched slightly lower than the one before. The Gungan smiled pleasantly and cocked his head to one side. You saw to get that looked at, eh? Missa, take this to the boss. One more thing, I-5 said, before the cook could pocket the crystal and move away. Tell the Sakian I will see him tomorrow at sunset. He knows the place. The Gungan nodded his head causing his long ear flaps to dance about his shoulders. No problem. Misa tell him this. When the Gungan cook had gone to deliver the crystal and the message, which was that the work would really be done at 0400 hours, three hours earlier than stated, Den looked up at I-5 with dread tugging at his heart. You've decided what you're going to do about the plan? No but I have given myself a deadline. I will decide by the time I see my contact tomorrow. Don't do it, Five. The risk, it's just too big. This whole thing is too big. I-5 turned to look down at him, optical receptors bright in the dim interior of the charity's back corridors. With all due respect, Den, and I mean that, I think I'm in a better position to gauge the risks than you are. My processor, in fact, has already calculated all the possible scenarios and variables inherent in my agreeing. I only await the majority opinion of the team before making my decision. And... I promise you, I will not take on this charge if Jax and the others feel that it's wrong. Wrong. 
not inadvisable, not illogical, not stupidly dangerous, not lethal. Wrong. Den shook his head and followed I-5 back out into the street. When droids started philosophizing about morality and ethics. Maybe it was time to investigate cyborg implants and a lobotomy. Twelve. It had wafted to him, born on the winds of the Force, and he had known it immediately for what it was, a release of Force energy that possessed a peculiar edge. Neither of his fellows had noticed it, a fact that gave him a perverse tickle of pride. Not all Inquisitors were created equal, it seemed. The intriguing sensation grew in strength as they pressed onward, rising several levels to a more affluent sector. As they drew nearer the source, it began to flash across his sight in lambent flurries of sparks. They had just entered a neighborhood in which quartets of resiblocks were built around deeply buried courtyards and plazas when he was brought up short by its intensity. A shower of sparks all but blinded him. His skin flushed with heat. A strange roaring filled his ears. The tang of ozone was in his nostrils. And then it was gone. Completely and utterly gone. As if someone had thrown a thermoblanket over a fire. Tesla cast about helplessly and futilely, snarling in the rage of bereavement. It was him. I know it was him. Pavan? asked his second, Ural Chael. No, not Pavan. The other. He felt Chael trade glances with the third of their number, a Corellian named Moss Sira. The prodigy is a secondary target, Probus, Chael said. We were specifically ordered to step up our search for Pavan and the droid. We, the pronoun infuriated him. After his injury at the hands of that rogue, that boy, his lord had seen fit to bring more inquisitors into the game. So Tesla had found himself paired with Chael and Syrah. He was the nominal leader of the grouping and was in fact charged with the prosecution of the search in this sector. But the members of his team each felt they should have been given the lead. After all, hadn't Tesla already proven his weakness by falling victim to an adept who was not even a trained Jedi? Yes, he'd heard the cascade of innuendo that had torn through the ranks of the Inquisitorius like a flash flood. He'd ignored it. Soon, he would silence it. What makes you think the two will not be found together? He asked now. The boy is a force prodigy of unbelievable strength. It stands to reason that Pavan would want to recruit him, likely in some vain attempt to resurrect the moldering Jedi corpse. Again, the two other Inquisitors exchanged glances. This time it was Moss Sira who spoke. What makes you suppose that Pavan even knows of his existence? Don't be stupid, Moss. Such a power is like gravity. It will draw Jack's Pavan just as it draws me. During the conversation, he had been trying to reacquire the scent of that other Force-sensitive, scouring walls and halls and hidden rooms with his mind, and finding only echoes, ghost perfumes. He peered down one long, convoluted alley with the unlikely name of Snowblind Muse. But no, the trail was gone, like smoke flayed to transparency by a breeze. He turned to his peers. Pavan is somewhere on this level. Maybe he lives here, or maybe he's just hiding here, but he's here now. Stay in the area. I'll report to Lord Vader. They nodded in unison and glided into the shadows while Tesla pulled out his comlink. The look on Dijadoire's expressive face betrayed a jumble of emotions. Shock, affront, curiosity, trepidation. She pushed back the cowl of her robe and stared at him. You... Want to move to the studio? Not all of us, maybe, but at least Kaj and me. Jax hated asking this of her. He could see that it was wreaking havoc on her composure. I hate hitting you with this, DJ, and if I felt I had any choice, I wouldn't do it. 
but Kaj isn't in complete control of his talent, and I need to put him someplace where he stands half a chance of remaining concealed until I can complete his training, or at least teach him how to govern his impulses. Right now, the Force is reacting to his every emotion. If he feels anger, the Force amplifies that anger until it's out of his control. Are you sure Vess's sculptures will shield him? Not sure, but very hopeful. Especially if I-5 and I can modify them so that the field is widened and stabilized. Now she was simply stunned. You want to modify them? You want to change them? That is usually what the word modify means, Renan said from the doorway of the workroom. Jax lifted a hand to prevent him from saying more, actually putting a bit of the force into the gesture for emphasis. The Elliman would experience it as the sensation of an invisible hand clamped over his mouth for a moment. His eyes widened and his lips compressed to an even thinner line than usual, but he stayed put. Jax wished he would just go away, but he refused to use the force for that sort of petty manipulation. Surely there are alternatives, Deja said. You could take him to the whiplash. Don't they have safe houses that... There's no safe house that's proof to a force prodigy of Kaja's power. They'd have to keep him tranquilized, day and night. So they keep him tranquilized. You've got him tranquilized now, so he can sleep safely. But that's only a stopgap measure. Keeping him that way for any length of time would do him irreparable harm, and only make him more inclined to emotional overload and explosion. Deja moved closer to Jax, laying her hands on his arm. He instinctively raised a barrier of tightly woven force threads against her involuntary assault on his senses. Then let's use whiplash resources to smuggle Kaj off-world. The Togruta is being moved tomorrow morning, right? Can't we move Kaj at the same time? Jax shook his head. Kaj's talent makes him a huge liability, Deja. We don't have the safeguards in place to move him off-world without tremendous risk to everyone. What I'm asking of you is the only way to minimize the danger. Once Kaj is trained, he'll be able to control his emotions, and then he can learn to control his use of the Force. She stared up at him for a long moment, her eyes searching his face. Finally, she sighed and stepped back, relinquishing her grip on his arm. Yes, yes, of course, you're right. I just, those sculptures meant so much to me, to Vess. And now they represent irreplaceable financial resources. I'll try to use the minimum amount to do what needs doing, and try not to modify them irretrievably. It may even be possible for I-5 to memorize Vess's settings and return them to their original configuration. She nodded. All right, yes. Of course you can use the studio and the sculptures. How soon do you want to move him? Her gaze flickered toward Jax's quarters, where Kaj slept a deep, chemically augmented, and hopefully dreamless sleep. As soon as I-5 and Den get back. We'll need to get an airspeeder. Jax glanced over at Renan, who responded with a courtly bow that was somehow laced with irony. It was most often the Elliman's job to arrange for transport and other resources, simply because, having been high up within the Imperial apparatus, he knew how to acquire them without drawing undue attention. I shall, of course, arrange it, Renan said. Anything else? No. And thanks, Renan. I don't know what we'd do without you, Jack said. The Elliman's eyes closed and opened, in an almost reptilian blink, his entire body language eloquent of surprise. Then he inclined his head and disappeared into the workroom. I won't go with you, Deja said. To the studio, I mean. I don't think I could bear to see... She left Jax to imagine what the end of the sentence might have been. I couldn't bear to see where Vesvalet died, or... I couldn't bear to see the sculptures that shielded him from me, or I couldn't bear to see you mangle his work. In any case, Jax was surprised to realize that he felt a strange mixture of disappointment 
and relief. He watched her go into her room, aware of a budding tension that sat between his shoulder blades like an unreachable itch. He hoped Dan and I-5 would get back soon. He wanted to go out and look for them, to hasten their return, but knew it would be dangerous to leave Kaj here untended. There was no way to know how long the anti-stim would work on someone with his abilities, or in what state of mind he'd awaken. Dendur was in a black mood. More than any time since he'd signed on with I-5 and company, he felt as if everything was spinning hopelessly out of control. There were too many players, too many half-concealed agendas, and way too many risks. He glanced up at I-5, who moved silently beside him as they made their way back to Pelota Place. He had expected that the droid would be more concerned about the sudden interest Renan and Deja had shown in the Bota, and would confide something in him. But even that expectation was doomed to disappointment. After that brief conversation, during which Den felt as if he'd finally gotten I-5's full attention, it had been business as usual. They stepped out of the anti-grav tube a block from the entrance to the Reza block and made their way west. Den found himself watching passers-by. It was an old habit, dating back to his days as a news being. He used to say that he could pick any face at random out of a sea of beings and twirl a story about him, her, or it that, often as not, was remarkably close to the truth. Now, tired of staring at kneecaps, he walked with his head tilted back. It made it difficult at times to keep his footing, but it was also the reason he saw the robed and hooded figure turn from the railing of a balcony two floors above street level in the building they were currently passing. There was no question this time. The iridescent shifting robes, the cowl, the sense of presence. This was not mistaken identity. This was the real thing. Den stumbled, and I-5 put a hand down to steady him. Are you all right? Den clung to the droid's arm, pretending vertigo, and murmured, Balcony on the left, second floor. I-5 straightened slightly. Someone just went inside. An inquisitor. An inquisitor just went inside. He was watching the street, watching the entrance to the mews. I-5 put Den firmly on his feet. Do tell. Don't be so frippin' sanguine about it, Five. Why are they here? I could wager a guess. Den's heart threatened to shift into reverse. The kid. You think they're after the kid? Or, I think, said I-5, turning him about and pushing him back the way they'd come. That we need to find an alternative means of getting into Poloda Place. The alternative means turned out to be a disguise, not for Den, but for I-5. Back down in Plautical, at a shop claiming the finest fabrics in the Zikri sector, the droid purchased a skin suit that turned him into a perfectly credible kurivar, right up to the multi-hued spiraling horn that sat atop his head. It was a large horn, bespeaking great social stature, and the robes that he purchased to go with it expanded on the impression that this was an affluent personage of much wealth and prestige. Half an hour after their initial foray into the mews, Dan and I-5 made their way back again, the Celestin pretending to be a property agent, showing this fine citizen available habitations in the area. They approached the entrance to Snowblind Mews, Den feeling as if eyes were lasering into his back, he saw no inquisitors this time as they made their way into the alley's mouth, but they kept up their charade anyway. So despite the fact that he was sweating like a stuck ronto, Den managed to keep his voice energetic and plucky as he loudly described the features of the properties he was proud to represent. These conaps are roomy, comfortable, and quite chic when it comes to accoutrements. High ceilings, Duracrete floors, molded to look like cobbles in the food preparation area, reduces slippage, you know, and sonic or steam showers, buyer's choice. What about natural light? growled I-5 in a perfect Kurabar accent. I must have natural light. Then you've come to the right agent, Den enthused, as they started up the dark winding way to Pelota Place. 
I can get you a unit with natural light brought down all the way from the highest levels of the city. How is this possible? Oh, the old architects knew what they were doing. The light is channeled by a series of movable mirrors. As Den babbled, having no idea if there was any truth at all in what he was claiming, he peered behind them. No one followed. Ah, yes, of course. How many rooms? As many as you need. You have a wife? Children? At I-5's nod, Den said, Well, let me just show you what's up ahead here. A marvelous place for the kiddies to play. They picked up their pace, Den casting furtive glances over his shoulder. Still no followers. They emerged into the plaza, and Den trotted to the center to turn in place, arms wide. You see, just as I said, room for your children to play. Though I wouldn't recommend they be left unmonitored. A number of the units look out on the plaza, of course, and he cut off as his eyes caught on a reflected image in one of the tall, narrow windows. There was an inquisitor standing in the shadow of an overhanging eave in the building facing their own. He was looking right at them. Den's stomach abruptly felt like someone had just flicked the on-off switch for Coruscant's gravity. Yes, yes. But have you anything on the third level? Something with a window that looks out on this court? Den spun to look at the droid, wondering if those omniscient photoreceptors had finally missed something. But then, his hands steepled before him, I-5 made a minute gesture. It's your lucky day, friend, said Den. I have an empty unit on the third floor of this building that just came open. The previous lessees were an odd bunch, secretive peculiar. One might almost be tempted to suspect criminal behavior. He bustled toward their building as he spoke. Inside the building, it was all Den could do not to race to the lift and throw himself in. Once out of the lift on the third floor, he continued to fight the urge to run, but rather kept prattling about this or that lovely feature of this well-built structure. At the front door of the Conapt, he glanced up at I-5. If he gave his usual verbal passcode to enter, and an inquisitor overheard it. The droid pulled aside the sleeve of his robe to display the gleaming tip of one index finger. He would use his laser on lowest power to beam the code into the house computer. Weak with relief, Den turned to the door and said, Hato Rondin, a name he made up on the fly. The door slid open, and Den turned to his client and bowed. After you. Five nodded and entered, Den following. They'd no more cleared the door when Jax appeared, his gaze flickering from Den to the apparent Kurivar. Den, who is... He stared hard at the droid. I-5? Gotta love that force, Den murmured. Why are you in dis- Jack started, then apparently changed his mind. It doesn't matter. Come on, we need to get Kaj out of here and over to Vesvalet's studio now. Yes, it does matter, said I-5 with unbelievably irritating calm. There is an inquisitor in the courtyard. Jax looked shocked. I didn't, he murmured, then clearly did. The Tao Zin effect and I wasn't looking for it. Something happened with Kaj, I take it? I-5 asked. Jax nodded. He had an episode, almost a seizure. He was lonely and angry, and it got to be too much for him. I was wondering if anyone picked it up. I guess I've got my answer. He turned and moved to the window. Thick and narrow, the panel of transparent steel ran the entire height of the reservoir, intersecting every floor. Dan and I-5 followed to look down into the courtyard. The Inquisitor was nowhere in sight, which, of course, meant nothing. Okay, Jack said. Renan's got an airspeeder waiting for us on level seven. We're going to have to make a run for it. Get Kaj into the speeder and... That won't be necessary, said I-5. Dan and I played the roles of an agent and his client to our unsuspecting audience. I'm supposedly thinking of leasing this overpriced pile of ferrocrete. If our friend the Inquisitor stays in the courtyard, he will be expecting us to leave at some point. 
this could work to our advantage. Den nodded. I get it. We can provide a distraction while we take Kaj up to the docking station. Or, or, said Jax, we can take Kaj out right under his nose. He turned to their de facto logistics officer. Renan, did the speeder come with a driver? Yes, a protocol droid. What model? asked I-5. It's a 3PO. That'll do. That'll do what? asked Den. He felt as if bolts of blaster fire were zooming back and forth over his head, a scenario that he had no trouble believing would be reality shortly. Jax's eyes were alight with something unhealthily close to excitement. He turned to Rena. In about ten minutes, have the driver bring the airspeeder down to the front door. Renan gaped. Land it in the courtyard? In plain sight? Exactly. Instruct him to come up to this conapt. He'll be taking our property agent and his client off to sign some papers. Renan disappeared back into his lair. Jax was in motion again, this time heading for his quarters. He beckoned I-5 and Den to follow. I can explain he said to Den, but the Celestin interrupted. I'm sure you can, he said. What scares me is that the explanations are starting to make sense to me. Even when I'm sober, he added, which I devoutly wish I wasn't at this point. Be that as it may, Jack said, you and I five are going to take our Kuravar friend to your office to sign lease papers. I may have found a basic flaw in your ingenious scheme, namely that I-5 is our Kurivar friend. Not for long. The scariest thing about the whole maneuver was waking Kaj. Jax did this with his own force threads tightly held, ready to shield any anomalies. As an added, though possibly useless, precaution, they carried the boy into the living room and placed him on a couch so that the light sculpture lay between him and the forecourt of Pelota Palace. If the Inquisitor was still there, and if the cloaking effect worked at that distance, and if Jax didn't have to resort to extreme measures to calm Kaj, they just might get him out without being detected. As easy as navigating an asteroid field. End of Star Wars Koru Scan Knights, Volume 3 Patterns of Force Part 1 of 2 Restored and Remastered by The Archivist Publishing